and uh, thank you recording it's now so i'll just repeat that it's my pleasure to um open the public regional council public transport committee and welcome to everyone here uh just a statement that we need to say uh to i remind members and staff that the public sessions of this meeting are being live streamed and recorded and that the recording will be made available to the Bay of Plenty Regional Council website following this meeting. I also remind all present that local government decision making affords no protection to councillors, council officers and the public for comments made during meetings that are subsequently challenged in a court of law and determined to be slanderous. So with that, um, let's get going just a, a reminder that um, as an opener that we are a governance group and we need to think strategically and not so much operationally but um, keep it at, at, at a high level and um, can i call for apologies i have an apology from chairman leader and councillor rose has um, notified us that he will need to leave um, at 11 a.m are there any further apologies? Mayor Judy Turner, Mr. Chair. Mayor T Judy Turner. And La, would you like to second that? Uh, um, move that, should I say? Happy to move, Chairman. Happy to move. Jane, are you happy to second that? Thank you. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Public forum. We have... Um, the uh, Hei Iwi Kotari Tauranga Moana Charitable Trust uh, presenting to us this morning. Um, so, um, Gordy, um, Gordy Rockhurst, you, you, I believe, are presenting. Uh, I see you've got some of your team here. If you'd like to quickly introduce them and then get going. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, kia ora all. Thank you very much. Now, I'll just clarify, my name is Gordy Lockhart. Although Gordy Rockhurst sounds fabulous, I think I'll change oh, that. I, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so, yes, uh, my name is Gordy Lockhart. I, I, I'm one of the trustees of the Te Iwi Kutahi uh, Taranga Moana Charitable Trust, and together with uh, Buddy McCarty over there, um, who is chair of the trust. Uh, and yes, this morning we'll be taking you through uh, a short presentation on uh, a request that sits before council. Morena Koto Namihi o te Rākia Koto, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, ki ora rā koutou katoa. Um, uh, yes, Gordy and I are the Chair and uh, Deputy Chair of uh, Hiwi Kotahi Trust. The Trust is, was established to um, organise and run the annual Waitangi Day celebrations. Um, and we're also getting into several other things, but not important as far as today's kaupapa is concerned. But thank you. Um, councillors and council staff and others for the opportunity to um, present to you in public forum. Um, for a number of years, the um, regional council has been a strong supporter of ours. Um, and uh, one of the things that regional council has done, apart from also providing some funding, is to provide free bus transport from downtown Tauranga basically out to the historic village which is where the festival has been taking place for the last three years now um, and so uh, there's a precedent for what we're asking which is um, that the transport committee gives some consideration to perhaps one um, the continuation of that support but two um, as a way of um, increasing the exposure of the event, if you like, um, considering making Waitangi Day a free bus day um, throughout the region. Um, so we're supported uh, across the board by a wide range of various sponsors, some of them who are listed here. But in addition, we also have people like um, the Port of Tauranga, um, Farmers who are, uh, as you know, are putting in a, a, a new development in Elizabeth Street in the middle of the city. Um, Windstone Wall Boards, who are also bringing their almost their entire business to the city as well, uh, with their new plant uh, currently under construction out at Tauriko. So we do have some 
some heavyweight supporters behind us, and I think it just demonstrates um, the, the width and the breadth of the support that we have attracted for Waitangi Day. Next. Right, so our uh, objectives, <clears throat> um, all around the treaty, of course, um, and to um, raise the level of understanding uh, where we can about the treaty and what it means, um, not just another day off work. <clears throat> Um, but the focus that we've been trying to do is to make this a real community and family event. So we do have a focus on getting families involved, um, uh, a, a range of people from across, across our community uh, to come together and collaborate. So it's not just um, a day sitting on the lawn listening to uh, music, although that's obviously a highlight, um, but we also have a, um, an education program uh, which goes uh, all day as well. Uh, we also have um, the ability of young kids in particular to get, uh, get involved in artistic type um, activities that relate to the day uh, and a whole range of um, other activities. If you haven't been yet, I encourage you to come next year. It's going to be amazing. Next slide, Gordy. <coughs> So all this, I think, is pretty straightforward to um, to this group in particular. I think um, it's, it's worth yeah. noting, buddy, isn't it, that uh, as a, a core goal of the trust that we really see this particular day as uh, advancing year on year. And I think that the core goal that we've talked about as the trust is that we want to see uh, on the news, on, on one news on 6th of February every year, uh, the events happening at Waitangi in Northland. And of course, immediately after that, uh, Taronga being a, a focus of you know New Zealand's uh, Waitangi Day celebrations. Yeah, certainly our goal is to make it even bigger than Waitangi if we can. <laughs> so working hard on that. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't spell buses. I'm sure it's only got one S in the middle. <laughs> it's your fault, Cody. <laughs> I think I've just been thrown under that bus. <laughs> so. Um, uh, these are some of the advantages we see of um, having those free buses on Waitangi Day, um, you know, raising, raising your awareness about our amazing transport system, actually. I think it's a, a totally underutilised resource, um, and hopefully that we can use this um, opportunity to change the way of thinking about that. Um, I'm a big fan, of course, of the healthy environment um, area and again you know, using buses rather than cars uh here we go here's an opportunity to make a make a good contribution so that's uh short and sweet yep no um, thank you now uh just to be clear we um uh, public forums we are not in a position to make any decisions today um on them but um uh, we invite um, members of the committee to, to ask points of clarification only, and um, uh, we'll proceed with there. Um, my initial comment is, it's a pity really that you went a little earlier with this presentation this year, because um, time is against us um, with, with the uh, scheduling of public transport meetings, but that's it. that doesn't preclude uh, at, depending on the level that staff can't have or the, um, the chairman of the regional council doesn't don't have discretion to allow that. Now I've got, uh, I can see five up there and I'll go in order that I see them. It's uh, Councillor Thurston first. Uh, th thank you, Chairman and Tenakwe buddy and your team. Um, I know we can only ask points of clarification, but I fully support this. Um, but having, having, having said that, um, Chairman, we've had these requests in the past, and sometimes they come with a very short time frame in terms of staff and implementation. But uh, Buddy made reference in his presentation to being at being region wide. So um, if we do tend to, or if we do move to progress this. Um, I would certainly hope that uh, we would check out similar initiatives for Waitangi Day across the region, both in Rotorua and Whakatane, and uh, make a similar gesture to other communities. So, but no, um, it's hardly a clarification, but a big tick from me. Councillor Nees. 
Thank you. Um, great to see you, Gordy and Buddy. Um, uh, the uh, partnerships with Māori is a strategic priority for the Bay of the Regional Council, and I absolutely support your call. Um, my question is, have you plans to have other celebrations across the region in, in tandem with your request for free buses across the whole of the region on Waitangi Day? Sorry, you want to take that? Say again, Gordy. I think, Buddy, you want to take that? He's on mute. Yeah, I'm just trying to find where I am on the screen so I can unmute, sorry. <laughs> Um, no, at the moment we are uh, confined ourselves to um, the uh, Tauranga Moana region. Um, we don't feel it's our place to um, try and tell other communities what to do. But it seems to me that because um, Regional Council has been so generous to us, why that shouldn't ex extend and um, be an encouragement um, to those other communities to also Mark Waitangi Day in an appropriate way for their for their community, and I think I'd, I'd echo that absolutely and suggest that you know it's that the idea of having a free public transport service on that day can only encourage others in other areas to do similar things with their own community. Thank you, Councillor Rose. Uh, tēnā kōrua, uh, e raka te rama, um, no mai haere mai e te, uh, e te Public Transport Committee, uh, ki, uh, ki Waitangi, uh, Waitangi uh, Day uh, e haere, uh, haere tonu au. Um, so, kia ora buddy, kia ora gori, hey look, um, I guess uh, my only question would be in and around, um, pretty much following on from Councillor Nees, um, would... Obviously, you don't work with other uh, with other organisations across the region around us. But would you guys be open to doing so if if it was something that could help this sort of this sort of cope up and getting free buses across the region um, going forward? Oh, without a doubt, I'm happy to uh, provide a template if it's needed of um, the kind of things that we do and how we uh, get ourselves organised and um, uh, who we can go to for support and that kind of thing. So, no, no more than happy to help. Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair. Kia ora, buddy. Kia ora, Gordy. Um, look, just a couple of points of clarification. The first one is um, your, and I'm going to call them your um, engaged audience um, who come along to your um, celebrations. Do, do they mainly come from Tauranga and the Mount, or do you pull from the, the whole region um, in general? So that's my first question. I'll, I'll cover that one, but if you want, if you like, in the sense that um, it's a very good, very good question, Phil. I mean, right now, um, we don't know. Um, we have some plans in place as a trust to actually grab some data around that at this next event. Uh, and uh, I guess the first three years have been a matter of build and try and get people there. Not, not necessarily sure that it mattered at that point where they were from. Um, but now we've actually got some good attendance base. Uh, from now on, it's going to be really trying to identify where people are coming from. Obviously, the idea of being able to pull in uh, some free public transport areas around uh, the Western Bay will certainly help get folk from outside of the Tauranga region. Um, but I guess if you answer the, ask that question this time next year, we definitely have some data for you. Great, thank you. And, and you know, here in Rotorua, we're, we're very used to um, hosting people from Tauranga and in the Mount. But obviously, we'd, we'd love to return the favour and let a few of our people come and see you guys. Um, look, my second question was just around um, the um, free bus service you're asking for on the day, either in, in Tauranga or region-wide. I presume that's all buses, not just buses coming to and from your celebrations. So you're, you're talking about, you know, the, the local bus to the shops and, and everything else. I, I would suggest so, absolutely, yeah. And I think the idea of having a free public transport network on Waitangi Day does more than just appeal to the idea of Waitangi Day. Uh, you know, it gets people out and about on, on a day off. It encourages families to do something together. You know, it, it's it's obviously primarily for the idea of celebrating Waitangi Day, but it goes beyond that to much more sort of societal centric concept. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Thompson, last question. 
Yeah, kia ora, buddy, and Gordy, absolutely brilliant. I know we're not allowed to make a decision today, but you've got the big, big, big thumbs up for me. Question to staff through you, Chair. Uh, when can we make a decision uh, in terms of supporting this simply for Taranga Moana and or the wider region? So when can we make the decision? Thanks. Matt or James, I suggest. Yeah, three, Mr. Chairman. So we'd need to look at the um, the potential lost revenue and quantify the um, size and scale of that decision. So obviously we're receiving the, um, the presentation today. Staff will need to go away and look at the implications of that, particularly over lost revenue, and then um, either come back to a council meeting if the amount is substantial, or it's a decision that can be made with, by staff within their delegation. Thank you. Um, it just leaves it to me to thank you, Gordy, and you too, buddy, um, for your presentation. I must say, you know, Gordy, when, when I saw your name on my run sheet, uh, I, I, I knew who you were. And I'm thinking, boy, that guy's <laughs> So, uh, but a good presentation. Well done. And um, as I say, it, it, it will be a, a, a more a staff determination than this committee just because of the the next meeting after this one is actually after my tangy day. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, sure. Sure enough. Thank you. So the order of the biz, um, items not on the agenda. There are none. The order of the business, um, it, it's as per the agenda at this stage, but with the flexibility to, to move if we need to. Um, any um, public excluded business to be transferred to the open there is none having said that oh no we'll do the previous meetings first um conflicts of interest are there any conflicts of interest from anybody there being none we'll move on from there so the um uh, the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 26th of august are on page six of your agenda would someone first of all move that they are true and correct record, and then we'll go to matters arising. So move, move, Chair. Moved by Mr. Thomas, seconded by um, Mr. Brunning. All in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Um, uh, before I go to matters arising, the public excluded minutes on the 26th of August um, 2021 are on page 83 of your uh, agenda with the agreement of the committee and noting that the only business discussed in public excluded was to confirm the minutes. These uh, can now be confirmed in the open. Uh, would someone please move that that be so? I, Councillor Thompson, you look as if you're happy to do it. And Councillor Thomas, all in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. So are there any matters arising out of the, the um, 26th of August minutes? Councillor Rose. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I just wanted to uh, quickly ask, in regards to the membership um, of the minutes, it currently doesn't have Councillor Brunning uh, in, the, uh, in the members uh, for Bay of Lenny Regional Council. Is that correct or...? Um, Councillor Brunning might be able to help me there. Uh, are you a, a member of this committee? I don't yes, think that's incorrect. Yes. Councillor Rose is quite correct, and there's an oversight, so that will be added. Okay. Committee ad advisor here, he wasn't present at the meeting, so he's not listed in the minutes. So it's an apology for the meeting. Uh, without having attended one, yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. Any further matters arising? Otherwise, we move on. We're right on the button for, for our, our run sheet timing. We move to page 19, the chairman's report. And um, I will ask, um, um, I think it's James and Jess. I'm looking yes, uh, James and Jess will be presenting that. Can I just say at the start of the chairman's report uh, that I want to put a big bouquet to our, our council staff in the PT area. Uh, it's been a very uh, frustrating and um, 
hard year with COVID as well as everything else. And then we did the refresh, the first first refresh of the um, uh, Papama Bayfair um, services um, right at the time when when Cameron Road uh, upgrade is is underway. So timing, you know, has been hard, um, but the end of the day, and, and there's always a lot of talk about decarbonisation and our challenge is to get people to use the bus. And I think, uh, James, um, I'd like to commend you for that work on that refresh. Um, and to Jess, uh, because it's most unusual that in the middle of a contract, you can actually uh, save a substantial amount of money uh, for the regional council in the contract. And, and um, that's, that's the outcome of this first refresh. So that, that is, a, uh, you must be a too tough a negotiator for me. But, you know, but if I need somebody, you're the, you're the go-to girl, <laughs> Jess. So well done you and well done, James. And with that, I'm uh, opening it up to you. Kia ora Koso. thank you for that acknowledgement, Andrew, um, or Chairman, I should say, sorry. Um, so we are, we're at page 20 of the agenda. And um, I will just be providing some updates on Wapakotahi funding to start with. And then James will step in to talk about transport and um, urban planning updates. And then I will come back to talk about some public transport operations updates. Uh, so in terms of Wapakotahi funding, we have some um, quite good news uh, this quarter. You may recall from an earlier meeting that we were waiting for confirmation from Waka Kotahi around what funding uh, Bay of Plenty Regional Council would receive for the living wage. So this year, Waka Kotahi confirmed that they would now fund the living wage to bus drivers and they would support councils by paying uh, the increase from the base rate that drivers were currently being paid to the current living wage. Uh, the issue for us was we were already paying the living wage as our council decided to do that without funding from 2019. And so there was no increase for our council and therefore there was no funding available to us from Waka Kotahi uh, as there was for other councils. So uh, we expressed concern with this uh, and we um, expressed that we consider this to be unfair. And we've worked with Waka Kotahi uh, for a few months now and uh, have asked for uh, the increase from the base rate that was in place with drivers in 2019 to the current living wage. And Waka Kotahi have agreed to that now. And so from 1 July this year, we will receive funding from Waka Kotahi for the living wage. Uh, and that will be the increase from 2010, the base rate in 2019, to 2275. So it's quite a significant amount. Waka Kotahi have included 3.6 million over NLTP 2124. So that's, you know, that's in our continuous program. Uh, so that's approximately 1.2 million per year that um, we otherwise didn't have for, for something that we've been doing since 2019. So we're really pleased uh, with this outcome and we're thankful for Waka Kotahi for working hard behind the scenes to um, achieve this additional funding for our council. Uh, the other update is around COVID, COVID costs. So Waka Kotahi have agreed to continue funding to 31 December this year. Uh, the fair revenue shortfalls from COVID in addition to COVID cleaning costs and other health and safety measures that we're having to implement across uh, all of our operators during the various moves through alert levels. And, um, and that will continue under the traffic light system as well. I'll pass over to James for the uh, transport and urban planning update. James. Thank you very much, Jess. Uh, firstly, Mr. Chairman, I'd be um, very uh, grateful for the uh, kind words that you've expressed. Uh, it really does mean a lot to both myself and staff uh, that you uh, uh, express your thanks for the work in what, as you say, has been a very challenging year. So I really do appreciate that. Um, just before I get into the transport planning uh, update, I would like to um, briefly introduce uh, three new members of uh, my team. Um, so we have uh, Vonnie Archibald, who has joined as a uh, program manager. So she has an overview of all of our uh, projects and programs across both transports and urban planning. We have Oliver Haycock, who has just joined us from the, uh, the UK. 
Uh, Ollie is a uh, public transport um, specialist. He'll be a team leader and you'll get to know Ollie very well in uh, future uh, public transport committee meetings over the coming months and, and hopefully years. Uh, and also Matthew Kilpatrick, who's just joined Regional Council from Becker here in Tauranga as a senior uh, transport planner uh, working in the transport and urban strategy team. So welcome uh, to you three and hope you enjoy this uh, PTC uh, meeting. Uh, also very uh, much appreciate the efforts of both my staff and those of uh, the public transport operations team. Uh, the uh, bus network refresh was a, a great joint effort and um, we look forward to many more examples of that in the uh, uh, coming uh, months and years. In terms then of the transport and urban planning update, I've got three short items for you. And the first of those is the regional public transport plan, which is progressing uh, very well. We had a very constructive workshop with councillors in uh, October, which provided some really good feedback on the vision and objectives for the RPTP. And yesterday we had a very successful workshop with the public transport operators who are ultimately responsible for providing the services that we come to rely on. Their views are really important for uh, the RPTP policies and understanding how uh, those affect uh, delivery uh, on the ground. And then in mid-December, we have a further workshop with councillors to start getting into more detail on uh, some of the policies, including, for example, uh, fares, which has been an active uh, debate uh, today. So RPTP progressing very well, and we're still on track to produce the final document by the middle of next year. Uh, the next item is the Travel Demand Management and Behaviour Change Project. That's also progressing uh, very well. So on page 21 of your agenda pack, you will see there is a diagram there which summarises some work undertaken by WSP to uh, highlight the broad range of uh, travel demand management strategies that we are uh, looking at in the Bay of Plenty. Uh, no real surprises uh, in there. And the key challenge now is to turn those strategies into actual uh, actions uh, on the ground. And to that end, uh, we are commissioning uh, consultants across the three uh, sub-regions of the uh, uh, so Eastern Bay, Rotorua, and uh, Western Bay, uh, to actually provide those three-year uh, action plans. So that's a really important piece of work because we need we're to start taking uh, some decisive um, action to address the challenges of single occupancy car use that we currently have. Um, the last item, and by no means least, is uh, the Wednesday Challenge Project, which at the moment is our biggest investment in the uh, travel demand management uh, space. Uh, so uh, councils, that's ourselves, and Tauranga City uh, with Waka Kotahi have jointly funded uh, this project, and uh, the setup is well underway. So there is a website which you can go to, which is uh, www.wednesdaychallenge.com dot co dot nz uh, well worth uh, looking at it's a very nice website there is a launch event taking place on the 15th of december down at the historic village and the program will formally launch at the start of the new uh, school year on the 31st of january next year so a lot of preparatory work is uh, currently going on and i've been very impressed with the level of energy and enthusiasm from the Wednesday Challenge team. And also in particular, a big shout out to the Tauranga City Council Travel Save team, who I think have been really, really helpful uh, in terms of uh, helping the Wednesday Challenge folk to you know, understand the realities of uh, life on the ground, particularly when it comes to transporting or getting children to travel around the network. So Travel Save team, TCC, certainly deserve a big bouquet from me as well. So that's just a brief update on transport and planning matters. Happy to take any questions. At the yeah, end let's take up. questions if there are any where you're up to there. Just um, before you do that, just recognising that the plan is to stop for a quarter of an hour for coffee, uh, have a break at 10.30ish. Uh, so we'll work around that. And we're hoping, just I never said it at the beginning, but our aim is to, to wind this meeting up by about 12.30. That, that's the schedule. So, uh, cup of tea at, at 10 30 ish, we'll, we'll work around where we're up to. Um, so, any questions to either Jess or James or, or staff? 
of C1 there, uh, uh, Commissioner Selwood. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Jane, for the report. Um, I'm interested in the um, travel demand management uh, report and uh, the strategies identified are very consistent with what you would expect. And I guess the engine room is the actions. And my question is, um, under the actions for travel demand management, is road pricing seen as a significant potential contributor to behaviour change? And is that included in the work program? Thank you. Through the chair, I would certainly suggest that road pricing has to be uh, actively considered as a demand management tool, not only here, but across the large urban areas of uh, New Zealand. I think in terms of the uh, TDM programme in the Bay of Plenty, our immediate focus is on looking at uh, free car parking and extensive free car parking and understanding how the TCC uh, parking strategy will assist in um, providing the signals necessary uh, to pro promote that shift from single occupancy private car. But yes, we do have a longer term eye and demand management through some kind of pricing, you know, in my view, it's just a personal view, not certainly one of the council, is that that has to be, you know, considered in the mix with all the other policy levers that we, we have. So we'll be looking very closely at any work that's going on either at a sub-regional level here or at a national level to understand how things might work in the, um, the Bay of Plenty. Thank you. Councillor Rose. Uh, kia ora korua, um, ka mihi nui ki a koutou, uh, e te kai mahi. Um, look, I just, I just wanted to express my uh, congratulations, particularly around the living wage um, funding. Um, it's good to see at the bottom of that section that now all um, contracted bus drivers across the region are paid the living wage. Um, it is very good to see that. Um, I know that uh, that's something that's been fought for for a long time now, and um, it's good to see it finally cross the line. Um, Mr. Chair and staff, are we discussing uh, the bus refresh and that yet, or are we? Is that next? Can I ask questions on that? Uh, let's just hold your thoughts on those. We're just working. Okay, that will come up, but we're just working our way through the agenda. Thank you. Oh, great to buy. All good. Uh, Councillor Nees and then Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Um, I've got two questions. One's regarding the travel demand um, strategies and the other is on the security uh, contract for Tauranga CBD and Gretchen. With regard to travel demand, um, what part does marketing prom and promotion play in this? Um, is it considered a strategy or is it going to be an implementation action? Um, I ask because in changing mindsets, we need to get people to be considering public transport as cool, convenient, and cost-effective. And we need a really excellent marketing strategy, not, not just an advertising strategy, but a real marketing strategy that is tar targeted um, to get the, uh, the, the mind shift and the behavior shift. So um, where does promotion and marketing play in your strategies, James? Thank you, Councillor Nees. Through the chair, it's absolutely crucial to everything we do. I think a lot of public transport operators and providers over the years have been guilty of thinking, provide something and they will come. And we don't give enough thought collectively to the marketing, the publicity, the incentivization, which is absolutely critical to everything that we do. In a later paper, we're going to be talking about the proposals for the bus network refresh in Rotorua. And as part of that paper, we have set out some uh, broad ideas about the sorts of uh, marketing and publicity initiatives that we could actually uh, look at doing. So it might be worth coming back to those in that paper and seeing what, what people uh, think about them. But in answer to your question, bluntly, it should be BAU. You know, this is something we should just have in our DNA. Thank you. Um, 
my other question is uh, with regards to the security contract in this, uh, for the Tarama CBD. And it's actually a question for Commissioner Selwood. Um, in our uh, recent annual plan workshop, um, we had a consideration put forward by um, public transport staff and Rotorua Lake staff um, for the regional council to also contribute to the security costs for the bus network in Rotorua because they felt that um, we were doing it in Toronga. So why should we not do it um, in uh, Rotorua as well? Um, part of the discussion was around that this has traditionally been the role for the territorial authority. Um, they provide the bus infrastructure. It's about security within the city. And rather than us leaping straight to saying, yes, that we would do a third, a third, a third with Waka Kotahi, um, sorry, taking over a greater percentage of the, uh, the costs in Rotorua, the question was, why do we not go back to Taranga City Council and ask them to reconsider their position that they won't contribute to the security contract? Um, just highlighting that other local authorities do regard this as their lane, their business, um, and we would very much welcome um, you uh, contributing um, to the cost of that contract so that we don't have to change our strategy across the rest of the region. Uh, Commissioner Selwood, invite you to comment if you'd like. Yeah, thank you. Um, this matter has been considered uh, recently uh, when the issue came up some months back uh, by TCC. Uh, our view still remains quite clear that we see this as an operational issue, um, that Tauranga City provides, if you like, the hard infrastructure, uh, whilst the Bay of Fini Regional Council or Regional Council generally provide the service operational aspects of the provision of public transport. And there's always a difficulty here when you um, draw a line. Um, and, you know, we do face significant uh, costs associated with the provision of, of the infrastructure, the hard infrastructure, we are behind the eight ball. Um, and we need to invest significantly and we've provided for that in our long-term plan. Um, so our view still remains and holds that um, the provision of security services is an operational matter, it's, a, it's a, a decision made by the Regional Council on good grounds um, that they can provide security uh, to their passengers. We understand that. Uh, security has not been a priority from an infrastructure perspective, uh, but it is from a service delivery perspective uh, for the Regional Council, and therefore we think that's where this, the uh, cost relies. Thank you. Uh, we're going for a Councillor Thompson, then Mayor Weber, and then Mr. Thomas in that order. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the report. Um, in terms of the um, TDM strategies, James, a question to you. Um, have you done the constraints, barriers, risks to each of these um, strategies? And I'll just give you one example. You know, you, you're wanting to create a new culture. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Um, so where is the analysis around what the barriers, the challenges, uh, et cetera, might be in regards to each one of these strategies? Has that been done? Yeah, sorry, through the chair. Yes, we have certainly done a lot of background research into the, uh, the reasons why uh, people uh, do not choose to use uh, modes other than the single occupancy private car. And when you look at the research, it's pretty much consistent across any, any area you look at uh, in, um, in the world. Um, there are certainly perceptions around the fact that it is far more uh, convenient, safe and pleasant to, to use a car. It provides uh, an element of personal freedom that I think we'd all agree is something uh, that is you know, unprecedented in the history of, of transport. And you know, we've had 50, 60, arguably 70 years of the car progressively becoming interwoven into to all of our lives. And that's not going to uh, be unwound in 
uh, five minutes. So really the idea of our TDM approach is to get that understanding of people's lifestyles, uh, how the car fits into those lifestyles, but understand what actually are the increasing disadvantages of, of using a car, which are around things like uh, congestion, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and increasingly safety. You know, you'll often find that uh, parents at schools complain uh, about traffic uh, outside uh, particular education establishments, but then will think nothing of uh, driving themselves past you know, other schools um, that are not actually part of their local community. So it's really a question of discussing on a very honest basis with everyone about you know how things could be better in the future and reimagining what we're actually trying to achieve in our communities, making them less car dominated. You know, and you have to look at uh, the jazz festival in Tauranga uh, a while ago when streets were closed and people were thronging around in the pre-COVID lockdown days to see that actually these sorts of uh, uh, areas can be uh, absolutely superb places to be when cars are not actually there. So it's getting those kinds of uh, thinking moving that we're looking at doing through this project. Good luck. Thank you. We'll try. Mayor Weber. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, further to Councillor Thompson's uh, comments, which, which I fully agree with. Be careful about getting involved in marketing programs. Uh, they are normally the last thing you do. First of all, get a marketable product that you can actually sell to someone. And, I, and also identify the other cost options where it's cheaper to bring a car into town and park in very reasonably priced car parks uh, than run, run a bus. You know, we haven't even addressed the fundamental issues yet. So don't start jumping into marketing programs until we've sorted the fundamentals out. I just recall with these fundamentals we've been talking about for 12 years now that I'm aware of. So like Councillor Thompson, good luck. Thank you. You're so right, um, Mayor Weber. Uh, I had a look at the public transport review in 2007, and we really haven't shifted. The, we were talking about it then, and, and for mode shift change, and we really haven't shifted the dial substantially since 2007. So uh, if you keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result, then you might be very just... So Absolutely. And one thing I would add to that, uh, Chair, is the costs we have incurred in executive time and councillor time, and, and we have to shift the dial. Um, what's the merits of what we're doing? Exactly. Um, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, thank you to Councillor Nees for raising the issue around um, security at, at bus stops and, and um, the ability of who pays what. I would like to say that Rotorua would love to see some financial support from um, regional council in terms of security around, around our bus stops. Um, however, we have gone ahead. We see um, our, our public safety as a holistic issue and, and we don't really separate the, the issues of safety around our buses and especially bus stops from any other safety issues, especially in a, in a city. Um, and I suppose, although Rotorua doesn't really have a security problem any greater than any other city, our local media seem to highlight um, issues on a regular basis. So we may be more, um, um, uh, we may be a little bit more concerned about uh, showing our public that we are looking after them. But we definitely would like to see some help from regional council, even if it was just a signal that partnership between um, TLA and regional council on all these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, just Tim, really, and I, may, may I respond to that? It's Jessica. Yeah, so, okay. It, is that okay? Yeah. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, we have uh, been working closely with Rotorua Lakes uh, in terms of security funding, um, and I've been working closely with Waka Kotahi to try and obtain that 51% uh, financial assistance rate that we were able to obtain here in Tauranga. Uh, Waka Kotahi have just confirmed that they will support 
uh, funding in Rotorua as well. Um, so I'm now just working with Rotorua Lakes around the costs of their security. As you, uh, as you, as you say, the security in Rotorua that's currently provided is is citywide. It's not just seen as an interchange um, issue. Uh, so we're just working through that and what that looks like. Uh, but yes, certainly the funding discussions are progressing well. And thank you, you, Chair. Thank you so much. That's fantastic news. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, both Tauranga and Rotorua are at this stage 100% targeted rates. So it has been funded by the rate payer, basically, but it's great that uh, Tota here coming into the, the mix. Well done. Um, there will be no further questions. That section, let's move on, James. Um, I think actually it might be Jess next, is it? In terms of the rest of this report? Chairperson yes, report. yes, that's that's me. Uh, so this is just uh, some updates in the uh, public transport space. Uh, I won't talk about patronage uh, during the chairperson's report. I will talk about that um, in our next report in the agenda. Uh, Western-based school services. So we continue to see uh, growth in, in our school services and we're still dealing with capacity issues. So next year we'll be adding another three vehicles to the school network, uh, which is really positive. It's, it's great that we're seeing such fantastic uptake, uh, particularly during COVID times. It's uh, going against all the trends that are happening across the country. Uh, so yeah, three new, three new uh, services there. Uh, the other day, update was on the bus network refresh, which has been mentioned. Uh, so with that, was implemented on the 15th of November, uh, and that optimised the network between Tapuki, Papamoa, Bayfair, The Mount and Tauranga. And we've had really good feedback from the community around that service, particularly from residents in Papamoa, Papamoa East, uh, who now have more frequent services and a much more direct uh, service into, into town. And then we did receive some feedback from some customers saying that the trip from Papamoa East is now faster on the bus than in their car, which is really positive and what James's team were hoping to achieve. Uh, the other aspect which uh, Chairman uh, has mentioned is that the work resulted in a contract reduction of $870,000. So um, not only have we achieved some uh, great results in terms of optimization, uh, but we've also seen that contract reduction. Uh, the other update was around the accessibility concession. So during this quarter, we also implemented the accessibility concession, and this has had really huge uptake and a great response from our community. Uh, we've seen in the first quarter 9,601 accessibility trips taken by 470 concession holders, and that averages out at 18 trips per user over this quarter, which is a fantastic result. Uh, we've been out in the community uh, working with local uh, organisations, helping to um, set people up with their B cards, taking buses out to uh, different communities so that they can practice using the B card, getting on and off the bus. Um, and it's been, it's been a really positive project to implement. Uh, one thing that has been highlighted, though, and we've seen um, a number of uh, complaints come through around infrastructure, uh, the, with the increase in um, passengers on using the accessibility concession, uh, there have been some issues, particularly around Farm Street, uh, where there's not enough space for someone in a wheelchair to get off uh, the bus. And so we're just really working closely with Tauranga City Council around how we can improve the, the uh, infrastructure around the buses so that uh, our passengers can safely um, yeah, get on the bus and disembark the bus. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to note was just the security services contract. So uh, we ran a procurement process now that we have secured funding from Waka Kotahi for that permanent service in Tauranga. Waka Kotahi are contributing 51% to that, as I mentioned before. Uh, so the successful bidder was Allied Investments Limited. Uh, they commenced in November. And that's um, been rolled out in a, in a very positive way. Uh, and we're continuing to monitor that with uh, Allied and adjusting security as needs require across Greerton, uh, Bayfair and down at Willow Street. Uh, the other positive thing from, from that tender is that we were able to secure the living wage for all of our security guards as well. Um, so, yeah, another positive aspect arising from that procurement. 
And that was all from me. So uh, questions. So questions, Councillor Rose. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ka mihi nui. Um, look, uh, I just want to say, as, as a bus user and as someone who did travel over to the mountain every day, um, the, the new bus refresh has been an absolute success. Um, being being out there, out and about, and hearing just the positivity around um, the actual bus refresh has been, um, it's been really good. Um, and actually... Uh, I think staff should should be really proud of what what you guys have done, um, and the new the new system and how how it is working at the moment um, is really good. Um, I just wanted to ask a question in and around uh, an issue around the hospital, um, because obviously with the bus refresh um, that got rid of the hospital link and the city link. Um, is there any plans to potentially look into making either the five, the number five, or the two W or two B, um, head to the hospital again, or is that is that out of the question? Just because that's probably the one set of complaints I am receiving is people in um, the Mount Papamore and Papamore East um, who work at the hospital. Um, are now unable to get to Mahi without transferring um, at Willow Street. So is there any potential um, to potentially review that that decision or uh, is that something that might be a bit difficult? Thank you, Councillor Rose. Uh, through the chair, yes, I think it is worth emphasising the fact that as a result of the hospital link being withdrawn, that direct service uh, from uh, Bayfair and the Mount uh, through to the hospital uh, is no longer operating. When we looked at the uh, levels of uh, usage just prior uh, to the changes, we found that um, it was relatively low, about 150 trips um, per, per month. And part of the problem with the hospital link was that it actually only effectively operated in in one direction. So although people could get um, uh, to the uh, 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 to the hospital directly from uh, the Mount, they could not actually uh, get back without that transfer at Willow Street. So, uh, in answer to your question, yes, we are certainly interested in looking uh, at the possibility of the five being extended. Uh, to the hospital to provide that direct link, which would actually be in in both directions and would actually make it much more uh, attractive. So as part of um, the phase two refresh, which we'll talk about in another paper, that is something that we will uh, revisit. The, the concern we had previously from the operators was the proposal to extend the 55, which obviously starts in OET and goes all the way through to the CBD uh, and uh, the proposal to extend it then further uh, to the Mountain Bay Fair uh, was um, opposed by the operators because they were concerned, I think, reasonably about the levels of uh, delay that were likely to ensue, particularly on uh, Cameron Road and also in well-known areas like Totara Street. So maybe the solution is to look at that shorter route from the hospital to Bay Fair by the Mount, and we will consider that as part of phase two. Thank you. Any further question? Uh, it then leaves me to, I will move the recommendation on page 19 that we receive this report, seconded by Councillor Rose. Any discussion? There being none, all in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Okay, we're now at uh, 10.24. Um, I think we'll try to get through the um, Arataki report before we have morning tea, unless there's, uh, do people, would people rather stop now or let's get through this last report? Any, keep going? Yep, let's keep going, Jess. Or whoever, yeah. Uh, through you, Chair, I have Simon Bell who will be presenting the Arataki report uh, with me this morning. Uh, Simon, are you there? Morning, yes, I am. Um, morning, Mr. <laughs> Chair and Councillors. Thank you. 
Um, I'll make this as brief as possible. Um, we're not doing a deep dive. It's literally just a, a handshake into the uh, report, which is part of the agenda. So um, I'll just share my screen here. If the technology plays the game, here we go. While Simon brings that up, um, we're at page 25 of your agenda. And then the Arataki report itself starts at page 29. Okay, can you all see that that uh, screen there? Yep. Excellent. Okay, so um, as I said, it's not a deep dive, uh, but we'll do a once over lightly as we head into morning tea. Um, but basically, I think it's been called out a couple of times before the key factor this quarter was um, COVID and the uh, significant impact on the uh, patronage. So quarter one saw 535,000 trips taken across the region, um, which is down 28.3 on quarter one last year. Um, and you can see from this chart to the right of the screen, uh, the yellow shaded area is uh, the very significant impact uh, caused by level four and then level three. So um, we had a 95% dip overnight, basically. Um, and that went across 21 days while we we're under level three and four. Um, but then we, we did have a very quick recovery back up to around 80% of um, normal daily uh, usage. And that was pretty much reflect, reflected across all regions um, uh, in the country. And um, notably in the last seven days um, of September, we hit 90% of pre-level four lockdown patronage, uh, which is pretty amazing given the... Uh, we're still in level two, people are a bit unsure about traffic lights and so on and so forth. So um, that was pretty encouraging. And you can see on the bottom right hand there, we're tracking very closely indeed to um, similar councils, Otago and Waikato. Um, I do have to call out a correction in your Arataki report, which I unfortunately can't see the page reference at the moment. Um, page Jen, you might be 32. able to jump in. Page 32. 32, thank you. I had that at the ready, but my technology is not letting me see it, unfortunately. Um, the total column on the far right, right hand side was incorrect. It was uh, hard coded, unfortunately, in the base document and had slipped down a year. So um, these are the correct numbers, and I can share that later on um, through a revised Arataki or, or through the minutes of this meeting. Um, I also want to call out some PT Arataki improvements. These are step changes. We, we're hoping to go a bit further with these over time, but just for this month, uh, this quarter, sorry, we've introduced some rolling trend charts um, for each of the key areas around the region. And we're highlighting um, COVID because clearly that's an ongoing problem and provides a lot of context around what's driving trends at the moment. So, um, We've introduced those. You'll find those at the bottom of each of the pages throughout the report. And then also um, we've introduced some top and bottom route information into the, um, sorry, I'm just jumping around there, into the key routes as well, uh, key regions as well. And now what we're trying to do um, is call out sort of more deep dive information, more useful and pithy information for decision making. Um, and that's all around the passengers per trip, uh, number of trips run, and then the utilization, which um, basically means how much of the average trip is to, um, have our bums on seats. So you can see there in Tauranga, um, which is the only region we've rolled it out for so far, um, just because you have the information at hand. Um, Route 55, you've got 29.9% occupancy basically. So that's, that's um, some pretty useful information and we're able to do that now that we've got uh, RITs rolled out, out across most of our buses. Um, and we will be providing that information to across um, Western Bay of Plenty and Rotorua and Eastern Bay of Plenty shortly, hopefully for next Arataki. Um, we also want to come up with the same view, but with a time um, perspective. So peak versus off peak. Um, so we can see which buses are running full and which aren't. So moving forward, um, 
Just touch lightly on customer experience. We had 3,800 uh, 3, uh, transport recalls uh, received into our call center, which is amazing. Um, it's 36% of all calls received. So that includes pollution calls, um, rates, complaints, all those sort of things. So yeah, that's uh, some very high volume. Um, a lot of those are around timetable queries uh, rather than complaints. So, um, and after hours, TCC received another 1,300 calls. So um, people are engaging with our call center really well. Um, complaints per 10,000 boardings, trending along um, as expected. Uh, Rotorua looks like it spiked up in September there, but a bit of context, um, that's quite a low number of complaints per 10,000 boardings, uh, really. It just looks like a spike and it's probably to be expected given the issues with um, the state highway upgrade and the traffic issues. Um, total mobility and accessibility, Jen uh, alluded to that earlier, sorry, Jess alluded to that earlier. Um, total mobility, we've had 14,000 passenger trips this quarter, um, which is down 8.1% on last year, but we noticed that uh, this vulnerable population is particularly impacted by COVID, of course. Um, and in a lot of the areas, this is their only means of getting around. Um, accessibility concession, Jess alluded to the fact that this has just been an amazing uptake. As she said, 9.6 thousand um, trips taken by concession holders um, and notably Kawaro, huge success. 7% of the total boardings in that area were uh, from AC um, concession holders, which is amazing. Uh, financial performance, I think we've got some uh, finance staff on the call so they can speak to any questions coming from this. Um, but basically operating revenue was down 1.2 million due to lost fare revenue due to COVID uh, of 400,000. And Waka Katahi is yet to confirm funding for the Western Bay of Plenty TSP and Rotorua's optimization um, a balanced approach, which James will speak to later on. Um, and that resulted in lower than planned subsidies of uh, half a million dollars. And finally, uh, lower than planned fair revenue of uh, 200,000. Operating expenditure was $900,000 down, uh, primarily due to Western Bay of Plenty, um, which has a full year budget of 2 million and uh, TSP, sorry, and Rotorua's optimization balanced approach, which has a full year cost of 1.6 million, uh, neither of which are, yet, are to be funded by Waka Katehi just yet. So um, probably will be further developments on that. Um, this potential for further cost savings as a result of the Tauranga optimization, which is being negotiated by with NZ Bus. Now that was at the time of writing. Um, clearly, Jess has mentioned the 870,000 savings. So that speaks to that. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I've got uh, questions from Commissioner Selwood, followed by Mayor Weber. Commissioner Selwood. Sorry, my apologies, I was on the wrong screen. Um, fantastic uh, to see the inclusion of the more specific data on patronage by route. Um, and already you can see just in that tiny little box at the bottom of page 34 of the top five routes, uh, routes in the, the bottom five routes that we have some information there that may start to enable us to get her under, under the bonnet of why patronage is what it is and where are the opportunities we can improve it or reallocate our service priorities to, to deliver better service outcomes for our, our users. Um, so it's great to see that, I think, an understanding of uh, patronage by, by time of day is fundamental to the reallocation of um, the provision of bus services. Um, I think we also uh, need data on what is the revenue uh, flow and what is the subsidy cost? Because if we have that, we can start to then prioritize where the revenue, uh, or particularly where the subsidy goes. Um, so I'm really pleased to see the start of that information coming through. 
to be honest, I'd like to see it as the primary uh, piece of information rather than the little box down the bottom corner of page uh, 34. But I think um, it, it's great to see that coming through. Um, I just wonder, um, the same sort of information would be valuable for the before and after of the route change that has been done uh, in Tauranga, and to what extent the information has been able to inform the decisions that have been made today on the new routes for Rotorua. Um, has this been data um, fed? Uh, are the decisions and the route selection based on patronage data by route by time of day, because I think it's fundamental to all of the revisions that we're making, to make sure that we're optimizing the service. And that's my question. Thank sure. you, through you, Chair. I can I can jump in, Simon. Um, sure, thank you. So uh, we will uh, we do use this data uh, for planning purposes. So James's team are always drilling through all the data that we have to inform decision making for planning purposes, uh, and certainly we will monitor um, the uptake of the bus network refresh in Tauranga. Uh, we'll report that back through the Improving the Network report to this committee, uh, and it will help to inform the planning process and decisions for uh, these, these next phases that we see across Tauranga. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Um, Thank you. Mayor Weber. Yeah, thanks. Well, I'm in the same boat as, as uh, Commissioner Selwood here. Uh, to me, this is the only page we really need to consider in, in this committee. We're monitoring performance, and, and, and it's really refreshing to see the data there. Um, I, I think I'd like to see it one cut lower, but, not, you know, it's how, how you present it. What is the highest and what is the lowest, as well as the average, so you can get to see the timing of the routes uh, on, on when your percentage is sitting. You know, any transport operator, this is the fundamental page they look at. It tells you have you got the have you got the vehicle size right? Have you got the timings right? And and the additional bit that I think we need to look at is origin destination of the routes to see you know are, are we you know you made a comment before about the hospital the, the the times for getting people to the hospital for work is at shift change so they want to go there and leave there at that time and also for the for the visiting hours so so I think to expand it out. And, and make it, you know, 90% of future meetings um, as the normal thing, strategy is what you look at and, and you need data to do that. I think this is a great step forward um, and well, well done for finally getting there. Really appreciate your comments, Mayor Weber. You, you're absolutely on the button. I've been advocating and it's great to see the B card getting the information. Um, you will be pleased to know that, that there was a, in the annual plan review um, coming up for the council, um, there is a request for a, a, an increased FTE and uh, we're very conscious of not uh, incurring big costs to ratepayers, but the one priority that I said in the discussion on that, and it was only a workshop, so no decisions have been made yet, uh, was that uh, I 100% support an extra data analyst to, so that We've now got the data. We, our staff need help actually analysing that data, and, and uh, this this is great stuff. So I agree completely. Any further questions, Chairman? May I just add one thing to that, of just you uh, can. by way of update? Thank you. Um, so in addition to uh, more focused resources in this space, uh, we're also working with Waikato Regional Council to develop um, a program called Leapthorpe, which will. Uh, essentially create automation for these processes. At the moment, we get huge feeds of raw data from the RIT systems and staff are having to wade through them. It's a very uh, resource intensive exercise. So this program's really close to being finalized. And once we have that up and running, uh, it will allow us to be more efficient in our approach to data. And then with the uh, additional focus of resourcing from staff, we do hope next year we can make a lot, a lot more progress and, um, and bring you that data um, that um, both Commissioner um, Selwood and uh, Mayor Weber have just uh, mentioned then. So um, we hope to bring more improvements next year. Commissioner Selwood, did you want to make another comment? Otherwise, Mayor Weber. Mayor Weber. Uh, thanks. Yeah, before we start trying to develop our own systems, 
might pay for the new data analyst to go and spend some time in the control room at Air New Zealand, Main Freight, Fonterra, um, some of those places. They, they've been doing this work for, for Fonterra that I'm aware of 20 years, Air New Zealand for about 50 years. Uh, we shouldn't need to reinvent the wheel here. We should be able to take advantage of programs that have already been written by other people. Good comment. I can um, respond to that through you, Chair. It is that the program we're using is one that's already in existence and being used uh, across the country in the transport space. Uh, and so it's just been developed in terms of reading the RITS data. So it's not a brand new program that we've created. So um, uh, yeah, we've certainly tried not to reinvent the wheel uh, where we can avoid doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there being no further questions, I'm happy to move the report. Do I have a seconder? I think it's just receiving a, um, let me just check. Yes, it's just receiving the report on the, um, uh, uh, Mr. Thomas is seconding. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Against, carried. Uh, so now it is 10 40, 41. Um, can we have a quarter of an hour coffee break? And come back at. Um, shall we come back at um, five to eleven, please? Thank you. Um, I see Mayor Weber's got his hand up, but he's not at his screen. Just uh, while we wait for him to come back, there's one administrative matter that we need to attend to. Uh, Councillor Brunning seconded the minutes of the previous meeting in, in August, and he wasn't attending. So uh, if it's with your leave, I will become the seconder and uh, rather than um, Councillor Brunning, um, and we'll put that back to the vote. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Excuse me, Chair, can we also just wait until we have a quorum of members with their videos on, please? Oh. Here we go. Thanks, Councillor Neath. Okay, so we re just redo the vote. So I'm seconding that motion. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Sorry, there, Chair, I did miss what you were voting on. Uh, the um, Councillor Brunning had seconded the minutes of the previous meeting, but he was not in attendance. So he could have done it pro forma, but it's better that it's somebody who's there. So I've just said I'll second it. Uh, Mayor Weather, have you got a, your hand up? Yes, I have, and, and it's it, it's in regard to the, the previous conversation we just had about the data. Um, I assume the vehicles we have have got uh, monitoring analysis running on them, on the buses, and we should be able to get from then what is what is the average speed um, that they're travelling at, and and time at idle, and you if you take that if you take that data and put it alongside the, the trip data, those that, that getting back to that data, some of those vehicles that are, that are traveling at less than 5% full, you'd be better to have all of those people in a car in terms of carbon emissions. And I think that's where you've got to get into some hard analysis to find out, are we chasing the right dream here? Because you know the, the, the reason for putting people into buses is to reduce carbon emissions. But if you've got the wrong size buses and you've not got them full enough, they, you're, you're actually working against your dream. And I think we've got to get into that sort of data now, analysis as well as how many bums on seats. Uh, thank you, for a very valid point, Mayor Weber. Before I, staff might like to respond to that, but, but just, just to let you know that the the current PTOM, which is the government's um, uh, requirement, is is for the big buses only, and we're hoping that that is going to be changed so that we, we can change resize the buses. Um, and, but right now, that has still not been agreed to, although it's been considered. Staff, do you want to comment, in it, James? Maybe to Mayor Weber. Yeah, I can certainly make a general comment about the the use of data, which is something that we are increasingly now doing, particularly in relation to patronage. I'm not an expert on the 
uh, vehicle tracking, my understanding is that in theory, it should be possible to use the uh, Dynamis system that we have available to in particular look at where there are delays to uh, bus services because for us that's actually a key consideration is where are the pressure points which enable um, buses to uh, run on time and therefore where priority may be needed in order to get those through. I think it's actually proven quite difficult to get that data into a form that we can actually analyse and I believe that is something that's currently being uh, worked on by uh, colleagues in the public transport operations team but I would need them to um, confirm exactly what the plans are because it's not part of my my area so I think the challenge is in principle we do have actually a lot of data these days but it's can we get it into a form which actually tells us something uh, useful which can then enable us to plan things. No, so, sorry, uh, Chair. I'm coming from the engine computers in the buses. They will tell you what, what, the, what the revs per, how, when the driver's braking, when, when he's accelerating, what, what, all of that sort of taking that data, which is telling you the emissions as he's driving, and, and are we achieving the thing? So using the engine monitoring computerization that should be on these modern buses, I know in my past life the technology was available in 1998, and, and was used extensively then. So it should be available in buses in 2020. Through you, Chair, uh, we do have uh, that data available. Uh, and so we uh, receive that uh, from the bus operators. I mean, you're correct, that's in, that's in all the buses. So we're able to track speed and, and um, a lot of different factors and things that are happening in the bus. Uh, as James mentioned, uh, it's really getting that data into a readable format that is easier for us to analyze against other data. And that's what we're seeking to make improvements on and to, um, and to increase our resourcing, which will actually allow us to do that, to have people here who can uh, read that data and, and provide it to the planning team so that it, it's meaningful for us. Thank you. So we're moving on then. Um, is Tauranga City, yeah. are, are they in attendance and ready for their update? Uh, yes, I am online. Brendan, welcome. And um, it is, um, we look forward to getting a, um, your presentation, which is um, about the infrastructure and projects update. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you. I'm just trying to get my screen to show. Can you guys see that or not? Not yet. Maybe if we can't see you either, though. No, um, unfortunately, where I am, I don't have a camera that is working. But um, just let me, for some reason, I have lost my mouse. So that's my main issue that I've got at the moment. Oh, here we go. Can you now see that? We yes. can. So which screen can you see? Is it the one that's showing the PT presentation? Yes, we can see the, um, now we, we've got it in slideshow. Okay, brilliant. Okay, perfect. Um, apologies that it took a while to get that going. Uh, look, thank you for having me along. Um, it's this should only take about 10 minutes. It's a really high level summary of just um, the funding that TCC have got in the um, LTP just for PT infrastructure. So there's about three or four slides. So if, um, if you're comfortable, I'll just quickly go through those and then I'm absolutely happy to take any questions at the end. Um, that might be the quickest way and I can go back to any slides that you think uh, you want to have a conversation about. Thank you. That sounds fine. Okay. So look, in terms of, uh, we have a number of projects over the next three years, and some of them are specifically PT funded, and I'll talk through some that have a reasonably large PT component to it. Um, so I'll just, I'll quickly go through those. So in terms of the next three years, so 
Council has funded 2.5 million per annum over the next three years, specifically to target putting in new bus shelters, as well as upgrading all of our bus stops to provide better facilities at the stops, but also to look at um, disability access and also access across the road. So, I mean, as you guys will be aware, a lot of our bus stops are on, you know, busy arterial roads and it, it's fine in the morning. You might be on the side of the road where you can get to the bus stop, but then when you come home in the evening, you've still got to try and cross that busy road. So what we're looking to do is look at um, pedestrian islands, etc. And so we've got a consultant underway on that project now. He has just delivered the first half of the bus shelter locations. So we've split the project into two components. One is the remedial work. So we've, um, we're looking to put that out potentially to our maintenance contractor, or we may go out to it as a separate contract. So that will be just simple things like replacing bus stop signs, putting in hard stand between the curb and the, and the footpath. In some cases, actually putting in a connecting footpath to allow people to get to the bus stop. But the other thing that they're doing is we've asked them to go away and look at all inbound stops and to um, come up with a location for a bus shelter. And so we will then approach those individual property owners and request permission for those shelters. Um, I'm not expecting that 300 people will be happy to have a shelter. So we will likely look to have a hearing at some stage early next year to um, put those through to comply with the Local Government Act requirements. So in terms of the other work that we've got coming up, the Cameron Road Stage 2 project, so that is from 17th through to Barks Corner. So we are looking to go to the market for a consultant this side of Christmas, closing in February. And the intent is that that um, business case will get underway in the new year. So the ideal timing is that it could go back to back with stage one. So as stage one construction winds down, potentially we'd be in a position to start stage two. The other big projects that we've got uh, coming up is 15th Turret and Welcome Bay Road business case. Now, Welcome Bay has been included because we are looking at the possibility of putting PT infrastructure from effectively the underpass through to the shops. Because one of the big issues we're acutely aware of is that buses just get caught in that slow moving traffic stream, uh, particularly in the morning peak. So that business case will look at that potential as part of the overall project. We're also underway on the Arataki interchange business case and consultation with the community is expected. It's sort of um, getting underway now and that will carry through to early in the new year. The Hewlett Road sub area business case is going to be undertaken in association with Waka Katahi. So the point of entry has been approved for that project uh, for Waka Katahi funding. And TCC are actually co-funding that study. So there is TCC funds being put into the, into the business case. The other project we have coming up is what we call the Area B Innovating Streets. And that really covers Matua, Otomotai, Bellevue, Brookview, and Judea. And it's looking at um, walking and cycling facilities, and it connects up to the Cameron Road. So effectively, it will form the, the loop. But the reason I'm raising it is um, probably about half of that route is also key PT route. So we'll need to look at how do we provide both walking and cycling facilities and PT routes. That project is going to market this before Christmas. Uh, the point of entry is approved. And again, hopefully we will be underway with a consultant in sort of February, March. So in terms of over the next 12 to 18 months, we have some physical construction that may impact on PT services. Uh, in particular, the projects that we've got coming up is the completion of the Monganui Road project. We did stage two um, in the last, probably about six, eight months ago, the last stage finished. So we are about due to start stage one by the Mount College. So that will start early in the new year. And then we've got stages three and four 
which take us back to Zespri. So that will then complete that project. So it's likely that there will be construction along that corridor probably from March through to ideally we'll be out of there sort of by end of October next year before the next summer season. Um, as you'll all be aware, Cameron Road Stage 1 is currently underway and is expected to be still finished in late 2023, subject to a whole lot of things like COVID, etc. But assuming we don't have any further lockdowns, um, yeah, we're on track for 2023. We have a number of low cost, low risk projects spread across the city. Uh, I think we've got something in the region of about 50 projects in the low cost, low risk funding pot. Some of those will be on intersections that will obviously have PT routes through them. So we'll be working with regional council staff as they develop and as we sort of start looking at those in a bit more detail. The other thing that does have an impact in terms of um, PT is there are a number of CBD projects coming up. Some of these are TCC projects, others are actually the private sector, but we're aware that they are impacting on streets in and around the CBD. Uh, examples of those are the civic redevelopment, which will be where the um, Willow Street building and library is for TCC. We've also got the court building coming up. The Harrington Street car park site is up for redevelopment. Farmers is still underway. Uh, we've got potential developments down Devonport Road as well. So they all sort of create pressure on the network, which may have an impact, but we will endeavor to work through those as much as we can. Um, it's difficult when they are private development because we just need to look at how we allocate the road space and allow people to move through the CBD. And that was it. So any, I'm happy to take questions. So I have a hand up from uh, Mayor Weber, followed by uh, Councillor Thompson. Yes, and, and thank, thanks for that um, presentation. Uh, a couple of questions. Firstly, I can't see any line items in there for park and ride, which we've been talking about for 20 years. Uh, and the second one, I'm a bit confused as to why you need to go for public consultation on putting a bus shelter on council or uh, Wakakotahi land. Um, is that common practice? Because I'm not too sure the other territorial authorities that are alongside you in this uh, regional group uh, go to that level. We, um, we realize it's a need for public, public transport, so they just get placed there. You'll always have some opposition from the people's property, but the other 100,000 people, where do they sit? Okay, I'll, I'll, I can answer those two questions if you like. Um, in terms of the park and ride, they are still in the, um, long-term plan, the key decisions for us is out of the PT business case that is um, likely to get underway in the new year, that will start to give us clarity around the way the bus system is configured to work in the future. And then that will finalize the sites, et cetera, for the park and ride and, and a whole lot of other PT infrastructure that we have got budgeted. So. It sits outside probably the next 18 months to two year period, but it's still definitely allowed for and budgeted so that, that it hasn't gone away. It's just, I haven't shown it because it's not in the next immediate sort of two year period. Um, and that's just because we need that data that will come out of the PT business case. But in if I could of, just, just supplementary on that very point, if, if, you, if you'd bought the land, regardless of where it was 10 years ago, you've actually got the land bank in place so that if you if you want to shift it somewhere else, at least you've got some capital recovery. The, the longer you put it off, the higher your input, your, your initial capital cost will be. You know, with the reason some other councils bought the land 10 years ago was to land bank it so we could shift it around if we wanted to. Had, had TCC thought of that? Look, I, I'm not able to comment. I've only been here sort of 18 months, so I'm not sure why i agree i'm not sure why land wasn't potentially purchased you know 10 years ago it would have been significantly cheaper but 
yeah, I'm unable to comment on that, unfortunately. Um, in terms of the bus shelters, there is a requirement under the Local Government Act. So we are required to um, approach a private landowner and request their permission to install a shelter outside their property. And under the Local Government Act, if they object to that shelter going in, it, there is a requirement in the Act to hold a hearing. So that's that's the process that we are following. So um, unfortunately, in the past, that's probably been why TCC has not delivered as many shelters as we would have liked, because we often get probably half of the shelter locations do get an objection. Um, but the intent is that we will go out consult on all 300 and then yeah to meet the requirements of the local government act we will need to hold that hearing to have that um, then approved by commissioners uh, councillor thompson followed by commissioner selwood yes thank you and thank you brendan and through you chair um, there are, to my knowledge, at least four very, very significant projects that are going to impact, affect uh, the Otomotai, Matua, Brookfield, Bellevue, Judea uh, areas, including the Area B project you've talked about, the bus refresh, which we're about to talk about, the intensification work, um, plan change 26, and of course, considering the new bus interchange for Brookfield. So my question is, as an elected member, um, with obviously a deep uh, interest in the area in which I reside, how can I be assured that there is going to be a very integrated approach uh, to all of these matters and that community will be front and center in terms of engagement and having voice and choice uh, in the design, formation and structure of their places. But my first, my real issue is I wanna be assured that there is going to be an integrated approach, clear accountability, so that I as an elected member uh, can on behalf of constituent residents actually contact a person or persons who can help me through what I think is going to be quite a mire. Thank you. I uh, can cover off that first question. So it, it will definitely have to be integrated. Um, so what we're going to do under the Area B study is there is some funding in that area for Brookfield, et cetera. So we'll look at them as a, as a package of work. It doesn't make sense that we sort of have multiple projects in the, in the one area. So we'll bring them under the one umbrella of the area B. In terms of the actual development of those proposals and what the ultimate solutions will look like, that will need to be carefully worked through with both regional council staff because there is a direct impact on bus routes on, on part, of the, part of the route that potentially, you know, the cycling facilities will go on. And then that conversation with the community, because I'm very, very conscious that we are also potentially creating a scenario where we've got walking and cycling, PT facilities, plus roads that carry reasonably significant traffic volumes. And we've got some existing issues such as the Brookfield intersections, which we know struggle at peak times. So it's going to need a lot of careful detailed planning to look at different scenarios, different potential combinations. And there will, at points, have to be some key decisions made around if we don't have enough space, does one mode need to have priority to get through? For instance, you know, at that intersection, we might be able to put the cycleway through another route and therefore PT has to have priority. And so those decisions are going to have to be made as the project progresses and I think as we pull all of the information together it's not going to be straightforward and it's going to be quite complex because it's also a conversation with the community around we need to create different mode space as well and to create the space for these other modes potentially means that we can't have as much capacity or we might have to take car parking away you know there's 
there's those trade-offs that we need to just be able to outline and then have that really honest conversation with the community is we we don't have the ability to have everything so therefore from a community perspective you know what's the desirable outcome but then we'll have to have the lens over the top that sort of says also from a network perspective can we make that work and that's where the complexity is going to come and i think it's going to be quite interactive as we work our way through it well, if I could just make a, a final comment, and thank you for that, Brendan. Um, you know, as a long-term resident over 35 years um, in this particular one of those suburbs, I can tell you that you're going to have, this will be enormously challenging. And for me, one of the greatest issues um, around community engagement is the transparency of the trade-off framework. Um, so it's going to be a challenge in terms of engagement with community uh, and actually that trade-off framework uh, decision-making, which is so important. But certainly um, I, I will be following it with a great deal of interest and I hope to see you at many of the public meetings uh, that I will help you organise if, if needs be. Thank you. Commissioner Selwood. Thank you, Chair, and uh, really just going back to the earlier discussion around park and ride, and indeed our earlier discussion, I think, um, in the meeting around data and, and meeting customer needs, I, I think there's a real need for us to work hand in glove between Tauranga City Council uh, and the Regional Council to understand what is driving behaviour at the outset. And we know that convenience is one of the reasons why people choose the motor vehicle. Um, but I think we need a much more uh, deeper understanding of what might trigger behaviour change and whether the options of providing park and ride uh, provide a more seamless uh, opportunity to, to make passenger transport convenient and design a system that truly meets customer needs um, and then actively promote it. So it's going back to Mayor Weber's comment about getting the product right in the first case. And I, I think there's um, certainly the, the Commission have discussed the, the possibility at a political strategic level of both TCC and uh, Bay of Plenty Regional Council um, representative people coming together to really uh, provide a governance oversight of that process for Tauranga City Council. Uh, well, for Tauranga City. Um, and this is where we're going to need the real evidence base to inform those, those decisions. Uh, potentially that might work, uh, Chair, as a subcommittee of, of this group uh, or some other format. I'm not sure of the format, but I think what we're seeing consistently here is the interface between the provision of services and the provision of infrastructure is fundamental to the design of the service outcome. Um, that, that users of the system uh, need us to work in a totally integrated way, really, to your point, Paula. Um, and I think we need to do much better than what we've done in the past in that regard, and that's requiring everyone to be very focused on the customer at the outset and then how we can design a system that meets their needs. Um, and I think that's the only way, you know, we go back to our strategy of delivering bums on seats. Um, that's the only way we're going to be able to achieve that because what is very clear is that if we keep on doing what we've done, we're going to get the same results. And so we do have to change the way we think about this. Um, and these are very difficult and complex decisions and they impact the communities, they impact behaviour, uh, they are highly controversial. And so joined up United Leadership on those issues, I think is fundamental. Uh, and, you know, these, these discussions we've just had just underline um, exactly those issues and problems and the opportunity of what's possible if we do get our act together. Just be assured, Commissioner Selwood, that, that um, the Regional Council governance body is uh, up to, the, to working collaboratively with you and um, Hopefully we can get staff doing the same and we'll get some good outcomes for the city. Uh, Councillor Nees. Yes. Well, thank you. I just want to thank and, and um, Councillor uh, Commissioner Selwood and, and welcome his words because it's something that the Regional Council has long talked about is working much more closely together to ensure that the customer's at the centre um, and we deliver the right outcomes. 
Um, my question is around your parking strategy. I know you've done a lot of work on that, and I'm not sure, Brendan, whether I should be asking you or asking Commissioner Selwood um, about where you're at with your parking strategy. Um, if you um, uh, have made decisions on it, what is different um, to what you've had before and what implications will that have uh, for perhaps incentivising uh, public transport use? I probably can't comment in huge detail. I haven't been involved in the, in the strategy. Um, my team though is picking up development of the parking implementation plans that come out of the strategy. So we are looking at um, the CBD parking implementation plan with um, a desire to have that complete in March. So we had originally hoped to have it completed in February originally so that we it would dovetail with the end of the current to our free parking trial but the resource we need to use is unfortunately located in Auckland. So it's been another consequence of COVID that we've sort of had to delay, but we're now on target to try and get that CBD implementation plan sort of finalized for that March period. I can just say Chair, through you at, at a high level, the strategy seeks to promote turnover. Uh, of vehicles and discourage commuter parking. And since um, commuters are the primary target market for public transport, we are hopeful uh, that by discouraging long-term commuter parking at either free or low charge, uh, but encouraging turnover so that you've got the premises that we want to achieve at least a, a vacancy rate of about 15% in the CBD. The, the, the fundamental problem with the CBD is, I would argue, not so much the price, but the availability of parking. Um, the, um, the availability is now very low. Uh, apart from those really early birds who are, who are really good at getting up early in the morning and coming in and, and uh, stealing an all-day park from everyone else who might come into the retail centre to do some shopping. So we basically want to turn that around, and that is the, the essence of the strategy. So if we can discourage uh, commuter parking and promote shopper parking, um, then we believe that we'll be able to achieve a better outcome that will work better for public transport, but also better for our CBD. Um, many of those trips for shopping uh, are just a quick pop into the town, do your business and, and leave again. Um, and that is what the car is ideal for. Um, not so good uh, just coming in for a 10 minute shopping uh, or, or a 30 minute trip and, and having to take an hour both ways to, to, to catch the bus. So it's coming back to the sort of customer focus kind of thing. If we can get the commuters on to the buses and then the shoppers uh, doing the, you know, the, the high turnover, high frequency. So the parking management plan will be all about achieving turnover and achieving a 15% free car park uh, kind of um, operating model so that you can pretty much always find the car park but you'll only be able to stay there for a relatively short time. That's the broad intention. Have I got that right, Brendan? Yeah, no, I think you have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions of Brendan? It leaves me to thank you, Brendan, for your um, presentation. Um, always good to uh, have you along at our, our meeting so that we know exactly what is happening within the city. Uh, you, you, we're, we're all very interested stakeholders and we do want to work collaboratively with you. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you for having me attend. All right. We move on to uh, improving our network, page 50 in your agenda. And that's James, I think. It certainly is, uh, Councillor. Thank you very much. Uh, so just a couple of short items on the improving our network uh, report this month. So the first of those, uh, and hopefully I've successfully shared my screen, is um, provision of uh, two new bus stops at the hub in Fakatane. And this is a really good collaboration uh, between uh, ourselves, uh, 
Fakatane District Council, and very interestingly, the, the mole owner. And what it does do, I think, is nail the myth that mall, shopping mall owners are not interested in, in public transport and don't believe actually that buses um, bring people into their uh, uh, areas because they actually uh, do. And the owners of the mall have been really, really helpful in terms of getting these bus stops um, provided uh, very close to where people actually need to get to, which actually is really great, particularly for people with uh, mobility impairment. So uh, we're very, very pleased that these stops were uh, formally introduced on the uh, 15th of November. There is going to be, I believe starting this week, a marketing um, publicity campaign to make uh, customers aware that they can now actually get a bus right into uh, the, uh, the hub at Fakatane. Uh, which will hopefully encourage them to use the bus for those very, very important uh, Christmas shopping trips in, in particular. So it's a really great uh, news story and um, well done to everyone who's been involved uh, in, uh, in that. Uh, the other item on the report is to do with the um, region-wide uh, free school travel. So councillors will be uh, aware that uh, uh, regional Council's long-term plan committed to uh, firstly implementing uh, a one-year trial of free bus fares for school children in uh, Tauranga, that's at any time of day, and further implementing a one-year trial of uh, free bus fares for school children in Rotorua and Whakatane uh, based around school arrival and uh, departure times. Uh, so those uh, funding decisions have now uh, been confirmed and will be implemented for the start of the new school year, uh, which is Monday, the 31st of January, uh, 2022. Happy to take any questions or comments on either of those items. Um, Mr. Uh, Councillor Isles. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And again, thanks, James, for... Um, giving the recognition to the um, collaborative uh, work that's been undertaken between Regional Council and Fokotay District Council, plus, as you indicated, also the um, hub uh, owners. That is part, and I mean, that is a big piece of hopefully getting the connectivity for um, our residents from within urban Whakatane out into the outlying um, hub business centre. But at the same time, we're in the process um, during the course of this financial year of hopefully um, another three bus stops in Titeko, another one out of the Ahopi um, by the library, and then, of course, one also at the Taniatua School. So um, the bus stops are part of um, the project, and I think I'm just taking on board um, Councillor Thompson's um, concerns in previous discussions. It is now a matter of us making sure that we get out and sell the idea that we have these bus uh, stops available and that we have these bus services that we would really like to see used as an alternative um, mode of transport. So a big ups to Regional Council. It is Whakatane District Council's first triennium on this committee and we really acknowledge the support um, we've had and I know I can speak on behalf of Mayor Turner um, by saying that you know we've really made positive strides. The other part that I want to touch, touch on that James also made mention was the um, implementing the one-year trial for the um, school children. Um, hopefully, um, it'll be interesting to see the uptake on that and, and look as if we, hopefully, that we can make it on a more um, permanent basis. Just going down to the routes that are outside of the geographic boundaries of um, Whakatane, for example, and there's a few um, routes there that um, relate to older tertiary students and you know, they're, therefore they're not part of the um, free fares for school children. Is it likely that we can revisit these routes at a later date? To... That's my only other question, but other than that, a big thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Riles, and yeah, really again appreciate the uh, collaboration we've had with uh, your officers in particular. They're an absolute uh, pleasure to uh, to work with. Uh, in terms of your question, look, we're always uh, looking at opportunities to review 
uh, fares and fare policies. The regional public transport plan, which I mentioned earlier, will be uh, developing a whole set of new policies around uh, fares and in particular how we uh, deal with different categories of uh, people, whether those are uh, socio-demographic or indeed geographic. So we will never say that we will not consider uh, additions uh, to uh, fair policies and promotions. So it's something we will certainly review in the context of the wider uh, RPTP uh, work in the future. Mayor Weber. Yeah, th thank you, Chair, and th thanks for the report. Um, just going back to the earlier report on uh, bar graphs on patronage, the more the more we move into free school buses or free, you know, school buses or buses for educational purposes, if we could combine the one graph with two colours showing showing the the free bus patronage and on top of that the general public patronage, because I suspect we're um, we're we're growing patronage and declining our revenue um, and make sure we're fully aware of, of the real data uh, by combining those two graphs together, you'll get a very different story, or I, I believe. Thank you. Any staff response? Thank you. There have been no further questions. Don't see any. Then um, we just have to receive this report. Uh, can I have a, a councillor needs to receive counts, um, councillor Isles as a seconder? All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Next report uh, is the transport bus, Tauranga bus transport refresh, part two. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this commences on page 54 of your agenda pack. And there are two recommendations. Firstly, that the committee uh, receives this report. And secondly, we request uh, approval of the proposed high level scope of work that is contained within this report. And that is shown as an appendix on uh, page 63. So following on from the success of the part one refresh, we're looking now to repeat the trick with the rest of the uh, Tauranga urban bus network. And we've already started to undertake some initial assessment of some of the uh, issues and some of the data that is uh, around now. So if you look at uh, pages 57 and 58, there is a table there which shows uh, patronage for the month of July. So that's just before uh, the most recent uh, COVID lockdown. And you can see uh, the top of the charts is uh, service one uh, with um, just over 10,000 trips in that month. And that goes all the way down to uh, the 72 A and B, which are the two uh, lowest patronised uh, routes in that uh, table. Uh, what is missing in there is a couple of other routes, which actually we should be uh, considering as part of this refresh. And so those are uh, the 51 and the former 57 routes. And the 51 is the one that uh, essentially uh, circles uh, around uh, the lakes uh, area. Uh, had in uh, February 2021, which is the information I've got available, only 312 uh, people and the 57 only 14 in uh, a single month. And those are clearly uh, very low figures. We'll be coming on to a report shortly about on-demand public transport where we can discuss that particular area in uh, more detail. But I think the point we need to make here is that we're not particularly uh, satisfied with these patronage figures, we feel on the basis of what we've done uh, in the part one refresh that we can and should be doing uh, better. And that certainly is our intention with this particular uh, piece of work. There are a number of uh, key issues which we feel are leading to uh, suboptimal uh, outcomes, uh, not only for our customers, but also communities through which uh, buses uh, pass. So, for example, we don't 
currently have an all day direct service from Todonga Crossing and the lakes, which goes via Cameron Road and the hospital to uh, the CBD. And that's quite a big gap in the uh, current network. On the other hand, we have lots and lots of buses that are traveling around Matsua and Otomotai in particular, where patronage levels aren't particularly high. Uh, also in that area, we have a number of routes going uh, in different directions on different roads and sometimes those uh, change between the morning and the afternoon and that is actually pretty confusing uh, for passengers and as a previous resident of that area uh, trying to explain it to people is actually sometimes quite difficult. Um, we've also I think previously discussed issues at Brookfield in terms of um, uh, transfers um, between services and also the need for some uh, much better uh, passenger waiting infrastructure uh, in that area. So there's a heap of issues that we've got to look at as part of this refresh. Uh, as with the part one, uh, the emphasis here is firstly on making better use of the existing funding we're putting into the system, uh, not adding new funding. Uh, and secondly, as with part one, we won't solve uh, every single problem uh, that the bus network has in this area, but we will um, provide a much more stable footing for any uh, future growth in services as we move forward into the, uh, the business case uh, phase. So in terms of the actual work, it's going to be fairly similar to that in part one. So we'll undertake a full network review and come up with proposals for uh, changes to the routes which uh, are based on the data that we've outlined. We will then undertake an extensive uh, public and community consultation exercise as we did in part one which um, was um, uh, very very successful in terms of the levels of engagement that we got and the quality of the feedback and then once we've done that we will come back to the committee with our proposed uh, recommendations for uh, changes to be uh, implemented uh, in the next uh, phase of work. Also worth again emphasising that as part of this second uh, refresh we are going to be looking more closely at the uh, legibility and quality of our publicity material in particular the timetables and maps and also looking at a more comprehensive marketing and publicity approach. So previous commentators are absolutely right. You do need a quality uh, product, which people can uh, understand and have confidence to use. Um, but we also need to make sure that those who are perhaps not aware of the benefits of buses and actually what you can do on the network, which is often a lot more than people think, uh, that we have the publicity available to make people well aware that there is actually a choice, uh, perhaps a bit more than they would might imagine. So in essence, we are looking to uh, repeat the success we've had in uh, part one. Uh, in terms of timescales with COVID and everything else going on, those necessarily have to be uh, fairly fluid at this stage. We're mindful that these uh, changes take an awful lot of work and planning and implementation in particular is very, very time consuming. So. Uh, a big shout out to the public transport operations team for their efforts on the phase one refresh. Uh, as I observe them from my desk, I can see how much time and effort they put in, not only during the day, but also evenings and weekends to get this stuff actually delivered. It's a phenomenal effort. So we have to be mindful when we are promising uh, changes that we need to ensure we have the resources available to uh, do those and people uh, have the time and space to be able to get on and do quality work. So ideally, we'd be looking at changes um, sometime towards the end of next year, but that will all be reviewed as part of the work we're doing to come up with a credible delivery program. So that's really all I want to say. Uh, happy to okay. take any questions or comments. We've, we've got uh, two councillors. Uh, first, uh, Councillor Thompson, followed by Councillor Nees. Yeah, um, thank you. And through you, um, Chair, 
In terms of the data collection phase, which seems to me to be pretty much by your timetable, um, not much further work is going to be done on that. Have I got that right? Because I would, I would really like to see some drilled down information, uh, not just the patronage data. And one of the reasons I say that is um, at the risk of boring you all um, stupid, um, half of these uh, services are, of course, in the Western suburbs. And the Western suburbs, like any suburbs, are unique. Uh, they have a number of um, elder villages and accessibility villages and persons with uh, disabilities. And hence, that was one of the reasons why the additional services were actually brought in after some very heated public meetings. So, James, my question is, I hope you're not just relying on patronage data without drilling down and actually really understanding what's driving what you might consider to be uh, low uh, patronage, but actually might be providing an incredibly uh, important social uh, mobility service for uh, some of our demographic. That was my um, question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through the chair, I can certainly provide reassurance that patronage data, whilst it's a really good start in terms of trying to understand what is going on, is only a headline. What we're really interested to understand is the value that the communities place on these services. And you're absolutely right for people without a choice uh, as to how to travel. And there are plenty of those around. Uh, these services are absolutely uh, crucial. So what we're not looking to do is to simply undertake a sort of scorched earth approach where uh, we look at the weakest parts of the route and just uh, cull them without putting something else in place. That's uh, not something we, we did in uh, part one, and we have no intention of doing that in uh, part two. Um, but what we are looking to do is understand where perhaps we are uh, over providing uh, services in some parts of the network and actually potentially reallocating that uh, capacity to areas that are uh, less well served. And we actually started quite a deep dive into a lot of the data, not only through the B card system, but also our uh, remix public transport software. And what that does is uh, enable analysis of uh, access through a 400 meter. Uh, maximum 400 meter walk to a bus stop. So if we change routes around in terms of uh, roads they serve, we can understand the differences in uh, levels of accessibility. So we can be confident that if we do make a change, uh, that the impacts are you know, relatively uh, small and actually might benefit other people as well. That with any refresh, there are going to be um, some winners and some losers in terms of overall levels of access. What we need to ensure is there are more winners than the losers and the losers aren't left um, completely high and dry. Councillor Nees, followed by uh, Commissioner Selwood. Thank you. I think you've, uh, James, has pretty much answered my question. Um, I was reflecting that in the previous regional land transport plan, we had some guidelines for when routes need to be reviewed, and particularly when patronage fell below a certain level, that there was consideration of whether or not we still provide that route. Um, I, I just wanted some assurance that we were looking at, a, a, at a, um, the drivers of, of why some sort of service is required, as opposed to just the numbers of people using the service. And I think you've given me that answer and of course the on-demand trial might be the sort of bullet to some of those areas so thank you. Sure. Commissioner Selwood. Yeah thank you and I think the discussion is uh, on the money. It's interesting I just did a quick add of uh, each of the routes that serve Motomotai, uh, Matua, Brookfield and the total patronage of those routes is actually the equivalent of the Pies Park uh, in, in terms of total numbers. The difference being obviously it's being served by different corridors through those suburbs. Now I'm not sure which is the best answer. Um, it may well be that the lower patronage on the higher number of routes might be a better service provision than, than one corridor. It may be uh, we are better to consolidate 
And I think this is where understanding the, the drivers of, and the potential target market and how best we can reach them uh, is fundamental to designing the, um, the routing. Um, and thanks, James, for your reassurance that that's exactly the kind of approach that you are contemplating. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one thing, um, James, that I know, and you, you're talking about the lakes and the figures for February, and you add that to the Lakes Express, and then recognise that when we develop the lakes from scratch, one of the key drivers uh, that we were asked to do by the city was to put a bus service in from day one, and so we, before the people got there, so there was a service operating, and it doesn't seem to have um, had had the the outcome that we were looking for. So there's there are lessons in history here that we need to take into account. But thank you for your work on that. Um, we have two recommendations on page 54. I don't think there's any further questions. One to receive the report. Two to uh, approve the proposed high-level scope of the work contained in the report, including timetables. Do I have a, a move by uh, Councillor Thurston, seconded by uh, Commissioner Selwood? Any discussion? There being none, I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. We move on to on-demand transport. Seamlessly moving on to on-demand transport, which is very much related to the, the previous uh, paper. So we commence on page 65 of your agenda. Yes. Pack. And before we get into the meat of the paper, it is perhaps worth reflecting on some recent data that has emerged from the on-demand public transport trial in uh, Timaru. So in Timaru, uh, Environment Canterbury uh, replaced pretty much the whole of the existing uh, fixed route bus network with uh, an on-demand uh, alternative. So uh, just to be absolutely clear in case people don't know, on-demand is where uh, you have a, a booking system uh, for uh, a series of routes to take you from your uh, home or a place near your home to a range of uh, destinations within a fixed uh, geographic uh, area. Uh, so there is a lot more flexibility in terms of times, places where people are picked up, and indeed whether you're sharing your ride with someone else who may or may not be going in the same uh, direction as you. On a fixed route, you all know where you're going all of the time. With On demand, that's not quite the case. So interestingly in Timaru, the first full year of um, the trial has seen uh, levels of patronage increase from 147,000, uh, which was the old fixed route network, to 171,000 uh, on the on-demand uh, trial. So quite a significant uh, increase in, in patronage. However, it's also worth looking at the costs as well. So the, uh, the old fixed route network uh, cost uh, $928,000 to provide per, per annum. Uh, so far, the on-demand trial uh, has uh, cost in the same period uh, $1.854 million. So although there is a increase in uh, patronage that does uh, come at a cost, and I think it is very important to uh, recognise uh, that fact in terms of uh, thinking uh, about the uh, future. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think it's fair to say that for a while now, Regional Council has been uh, subject to a number of um, requests to consider uh, an on-demand public transport uh, trial. And so with that in mind, uh, staff have done some initial work to uh, look at potential options uh, for a trial and just to be clear uh, we're not saying today uh, that we think we should go down this route and have a trial and fund it those conversations are still some way off uh, all we're looking to do today is raise the issue uh, discuss the concept that we've outlined 
and hopefully seek your endorsement to do some more uh, investigation work within existing budgets. So again, we're not at the moment asking for any um, further funding. That would have to be a, a committee decision and go through uh, the usual regional council processes as well. So in terms of then getting to the meat of it, which is the trial area itself. So we discussed previously the concerns and problems we've had with um, the area uh, around the lakes extending through to uh, Tauranga uh, crossing uh, and up through Pies Par towards Greerton. So the concept that we have come up with is uh, an on-demand service that essentially covers that whole uh, area and uh, extends up as far as uh, the hospital. So all the way up Cameron Road through Greerton on page uh, 68 of your agenda pack, we have uh, a map which shows, broadly speaking, the potential uh, area of coverage for the on-demand trial. Don't take those boundaries too literally, it's literally just to provide an indication of where uh, the trial might go. Um, and there are a number of reasons why we believe that this trial is worth pursuing. There are a number of areas of the lakes, um, um, particularly um, uh, past areas of the network, which are currently served by fixed route services, particularly Taranga Memorial Drive, where uh, there aren't any uh, services and the large buses are not able to easily uh, turn around. And so quite a lot of people have quite a long walk to be able to get on um, the fixed route service. We also feel this area has quite a number of attractive destinations for people to go to. So uh, Tauranga uh, Crossing uh, Mall, uh, the hospital, uh, Fraser Cove, Greerton, uh, and even places not even well served by existing fixed route public transport. So industrial areas like Malimi Street, for example. Uh, so we have a number of areas where you actually think people would want to go to, which is clearly a key criteria in thinking about any new kind of service. And as previously mentioned, we have some fixed route services, which, um, you know, to put it mildly, are not performing in the way we'd ideally like them to. And so one of the options here as well is to replace those fixed route services with the on-demand service as a means of ensuring the costs are contained within what we consider to be reasonable uh, boundaries. Um, we're really as well very encouraged by, again, the attitude of the uh, the mall owners at the crossing who we've been working with very closely to investigate getting um, provision of bus stops much closer to the entrance so that shoppers and um, particularly again those without a car can get in uh, and do their uh, shopping. The mall owners have been absolutely fantastic but unfortunately we've had some uh, issues with uh, access onto the, the highway network which means at the moment it's not possible to get full-size buses into uh, that area and get them out again but an on-demand service could do that because the vehicles are, are that much smaller and of course that's another issue that we keep um, being um, uh, told about that we have buses and vehicles that are, are too big so this is an opportunity potentially to trial some different types of vehicles to see whether uh, they actually provide the kinds of operating uh, cost efficiencies and also, very importantly, customer uh, needs and attitudes that um, we are told are things that now perhaps some of our existing buses don't don't provide. Um, there are options, for example, to look at uh, provision of uh, electric uh, minibuses to make them much more carbon friendly. That's something that does come at a cost in terms of premium. So all of these issues are going to need to be looked at. Uh, in order to come up with what we think is a, a sensible uh, and cost-effective uh, trial uh, model. What we'll be doing as well is some um, significant engagement with communities, again, understand their needs, and also work with the tech providers. So the key issue here as well is how do you book uh, an on-demand service? So if you just have a phone, um, that's not ideal these days, uh, a website is the absolute minimum, but really to make on-demand very successful, you need um, a, an app. Uh, and developing an app that's easy to use and intuitive to use uh, is going to be really critical to getting uh, the levels of patronage that we would 
that I ideally like. So look, in, in summary, there's lots and lots of issues to work through, and I'm not pretending in this paper, we've got all the answers to questions. That's the purpose of the, the further work. I guess what we are seeking today is um, some comfort that councillors are you know, broadly happy with, um, with what we're doing and what we're proposing in terms of taking the investigations uh, forward. And as I've mentioned earlier at the moment, you know, we don't have any firm view as to whether uh, we'll want to do a, a trial at all, and if so, what type of trial. Um, but if we don't investigate these things, we'll never actually get to um, some better solutions. So that's essentially what we're proposing to do. Thank you, James. Uh, that's a really useful update, and it was very good to get your figures there because I've heard how successful the um, Timaru trial has been. It has, yeah, I just did some quick calculations. It's increased patronage by 15.65%, but it's increased cost by 72.9%. So the average cost per trip uh, in the, the uh, first instance was 631, and the average cost per trip uh, and with the on demand was $10.91. So 631 to 10.91. So these are all things that absolutely have to be taken into account. Now, I've got three. Uh, I've got Mr. Thomas, Mayor Weber, and uh, Councillor Thurston. Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, hey, thank you for your presentation, James. Um, good to see work being continued on this, and I am really supportive of it. Here in Rotorua, we're very keen to, to trial um, this sort of system, you know, obviously we've got real issues in Rotorua and so we're needing to look at some innovative approaches. Just a couple of questions. I know that we had originally approved a on-demand trial from Kaurau, between Kaurau and Fokatani. I seem to remember, was delayed by COVID last year. I, I just want reassurance that that is still going ahead and this Tauranga um, possible Tauranga trial wouldn't replace that. Um, and then I think my, my second, and it's really just a comment, is it's clear to me from the other trials there have been around the country that different areas have different responses to these services. So I think it's important that even when we get results out of a Tauranga trial, that we don't just um, apply that to every every other area in the region, um, it may be that different areas around the region are still going to have different responses. So most probably still necessary to look at trials in other areas. So that was my question and my comment. Thank you, through the chair, I can certainly provide reassurance that um, you know we're certainly not uh, close to the idea of looking at on-demand trials in other areas. The, the Caro example was one where when we uh, looked at the proposal, we firstly realised that uh, a lot of the demands that that trial would have covered you know, has, been cut, has been essentially catered for by the improvements to the existing um, fixed route network 135, which has shown really good uh, patronage increases since we've um, put those those extra services on um, and also Caro wasn't at a point where we really had the uh, the technology solution that I think we ideally would have would have liked so um, you know if we had our time again I think we would be um, uh, as we are now um, much more aware of the practicalities and things we need to do to make on demand a, uh, a success and that's a key learning for us and we're certainly looking to uh, understand through this piece of work how we can actually then uh, take it into uh, other areas which as you rightly say have very very um, different uh, needs. Um, we are looking at the Eastern Bay for example in terms of a, uh, a PT uh, review following on from those in Rotorua and Western Bay. One of the challenges there will be to work with some really good community groups who previously presented to this committee, the Eastern Bay Villages folk, who've got some great ideas for how we can make use of um, what are some interesting uh, options for community transport and also making good use of um, a lot of existing um, facilities, vehicles and drivers who uh, focus on particular markets, but actually with a bit of coordination, we could get something a lot better for um, the money that's being put into it. So all of these things are 
are going to be continuing. I'm really excited that we've got a, a work program over the next 12, 18 months that we can make a real difference in these areas. Mayor Weber. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, be very wary, having lived in Timaru for eight years, uh, using that as a model. Uh, the CBD is in downtown, the industry is, is out at Washdyke, and you've got four main roads leading to them. We're a very different topography. Um, we've got peninsulas. However, having said that, if you looked at it in terms of Timaru might relate to Bethlehem, might relate to the Matua Peninsula, then you've got a whole lot of on-demand services. But, mm. but my, my real question about is, you're trying to determine the frequency of service for the people that need it. And it goes back to Councillor Thompson's uh, comment before, the people in Matua that are, that are in rest home bound or, or whatever have a totally different demand than those that are going to work at the hospital. So it's a fitness, fit for purpose you're looking for. So it's frequency of service and then the fitness of, for purpose of the vehicle you're using. And I suppose my real concern is we have a nine year contract. I don't know how many years to run on that, that is predicated on a particular vehicle size. What, what you're looking to do will, will, is a hub and spoke around an, ex, an express type service. How do you get people to, to make, to fill up those other express services, which is what you're talking about the lakes. And I think we're more better to look at the refresh thing to, have we got the right structure in place? And the first thing with the hub and spoke, how are we operating our hub and spoke as opposed to service? And then how are we providing those social services for those in need, as opposed to the workers that are trying to get to work in volumes around specific times? And I don't know that our contract gives us much ability to look at alternatives other than it'll rack up the costs because it'll be additional to rather than instead of. So I'd like to make sure that we understand the implications of our current contract and what we can do. Thank you, yes, through the chair. You're absolutely right. The current contract for the fixed route network does uh, limit our uh, flexibility to do things like changing mm -hmm. size of, of vehicles, which um, communities often um, want us to do. So the current contract doesn't finish until uh, 2028. And so we are uh, locked into the, the current um, provision of uh, vehicles uh, through that. But as we've shown with the phase one refresh, you know, we can uh, make better use of those vehicles in the areas that need them most and then look at alternatives for areas where actually we think the uh, larger vehicles may not be the most appropriate solution. So it is very much about understanding, as you say, those um, community needs and also um, the topography, the geography, the highway layouts of various areas and working out you know, what is the best sort of um, service pattern for that. Now, the hub and spoke at the moment will always remain as being our um, uh, overall operating concept, but the key challenge is to decide which routes are those that need that direct uh, service. So in the part one refresh, we identified the transfer at Bayfair from Papamoa passengers as being a blockage to uh, greater patronage and we've addressed that uh, similarly with part two of the refresh we'll be looking at other uh, transfers and asking ourselves actually is there sufficient demand uh, to make those services uh, more direct and where transfers are required it's essential that the facilities at those transfer points are much better than they are now we have really good bus priority so that uh, Buses are punctual, so they, they say they get there when they say they get there, and the transfer is uh, minimised, and people can have confidence in it. So there's a whole range of issues we've got to look at. Yeah, so my, my, my final comment, uh, Mr. Chair, is I think that's the problem definition that you need to do, and I think the refresh and the and the on demand are one and the same. And I think if you pick up Councillor Thomas's uh, Thompson's points about if you look at Mato. Bethlehem, Bellevue, all of that area as, as, a, as an area to look at it, where would on demand fit in with the, with the other hub and spoke type thing? So it's the problem definition and how you write the project scope around that. 
because I think you're trying to bite off more than you really need to by, to by going right across the whole district. Pick just because you've got more problems around the Martyr Peninsula, Bethlehem coming in, where, how you pick up um, Brookfield and all of that sort of area, and then Otomoti, Otomoti up to the Summit Road, Old Summit Road. Just look at that because that's about the most complex area you've got to look at. If you fix that, then everything else is pretty easy. Good comment. Um, Councillor Thurston. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Look, I, I fully support the recommendations on page 65, the issue of much smaller buses and uh, an on-demand public transport system has been on our books for as long as I can recall. But um, I recall one of the big drivers for this area came from Councillor Baldock and others in terms of we were trying to get the people in rest homes and the aged care facilities uh, more mobile and much greater access to amenities. So um, for fear of being accused of ageism, which is an operative word at the moment, um, <laughs> can someone assure me, James, that a lot of this um, trial will rely on a high degree of technology and the need for consumers to be pretty savvy in terms of use of technology. So I would hate to see the trial set up to fail if we're focusing on getting a lot of these uh, less mobile folk uh, greater access to our public transport system. Thank you, Councillor Thurston, and through the chair, yes, that we will be focusing on a range of channels for people to, to access the service. So it won't just be um, an app, and if you don't have a smartphone, that means you, you can't use the, the service. You know, the, the success of this has to be based on getting good access by whatever means people are comfortable with. Thanks, James. Councillor Browning. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I have some difficulty with this. Um, I think we need to stick to our core business. Um, and, you know, we really haven't tapped into the commuters. That's where our real problem with transportation is. I would rather see us concentrate on what we're doing rather than launching into something new. And just going to uh, Councillor Thurston's comment about a trial, I didn't think this was a trial. I thought this was an investigation. So can you clarify, please? Yeah, through the chair, I can certainly clarify that all we're asking for today is your uh, guidance and reassurance, essentially, that we can continue with the investigation phase of a trial. Uh, but before we can uh, commit to uh, any uh, implementation of a trial, we will need to come back to this committee. We will need to uh, pursue through the annual plan uh, process and also one last and very important thing that I was very remiss of not mentioning is the role of Waka Kotahi as a co-funder and uh, their uh, views on uh, willingness to uh, help us fund a trial are going to be absolutely uh, crucial to, to all of this so um, so far uh, Waka Kotahi have proved themselves to be very open uh, to discussions with ourselves around an on-demand trial. They've provided us with a lot of really good information and collateral. They've got a really, really good and committed public transport team who actually understand uh, not only planning but operations. So we need to work very closely with them. If we're not able to get funding from Waka Kotahi uh, as their uh, contribution through the NLTP, it's going to be pretty tricky to um, uh, fund a trial at this stage. So I think we have to recognise that as being uh, critical to the success. And apologies to my colleagues at the agency for not making that clearer during my uh, report. Thank you. Um, there don't appear to be any more questions. James, it's interesting, um, Councillor Thurston talked about um, the um, Pice Par, that, that new route that was a trial, and um, um, you don't show it here particularly, but that, that addition based on the pressure of um, a certain sector hasn't actually been that successful. And um, so we do need to proceed, but proceed with caution. And now I've got uh, Councillor Thurston has moved one, two, and three on page uh, 65. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Count, uh, Mr. Thomas has seconded. Um, any further discussion? Chairman, can I just make a point of clarification to my colleague, Councillor Brunning? Look, 
Um, Councillor, I, I fully understand there's a huge amount of uh, work to be undertaken that may or may not lead ultimately to a trial. Don't for a moment think that I'm pushing for a trial at this point in time. That's recognised in the in the in the um, resolution. So, what did we say? Did we get a seconder? Um, we did, uh, Mr. Thomas. So, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Against, carried. We're on the home straight, people. I wanted to be finished by twelve thirty, and we're going to struggle. But we've got Rotorua Public Transport refresh. Yes, thank you. And this is last and by no means least in my view. So this uh, item starts on page 73 of your agenda pack. And I must um, apologise for some formatting gremlins that seem to have appeared on pages 76 and 77. So in my word copy, uh, the text uh, and the maps are, are perfectly aligned. But unfortunately, in the PDF, uh, the maps have actually obliterated some of the text. So what I will endeavour to do is make sure you understand the text on those pages because the stuff there that if you read, you'd say that doesn't actually make sense and that's because some text is missing. So apologies for those um, formatting issues. What I'd like to do is actually start by going to page 81 of your agenda pack. And firstly, uh, I should also introduce uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Andrew Dyer, who is on this call. So uh, Andrew is an experienced um, uh, bus operator and passenger transport consultant who has been uh, helping uh, my team over the last, well, probably nearly a year or so now, both with the part one uh, refresh and also uh, Road to River. So uh, Andrew's role really is to answer any difficult questions that, uh, that I can't uh, answer because he's done the detailed work uh, and I'm just trying to present it in as uh, uh, digestible a way as I possibly can. So let's get to page 81 because this is really critical for the, um, uh, the matter at hand. So you'll see uh, a chart and a, a table. The chart essentially shows the uh, long-term decline in uh, patronage on the, uh, the Rotorua uh, urban bus network. So in financial year 2014-15, there were uh, 973,000 uh, uh, trips uh, by uh, financial year 2020-21. Uh, that had declined to just over 350,000. So essentially we've lost nearly uh, two thirds of our patronage over uh, that period of, of time. And I'd hope you would agree that on the basis of those figures, really doing nothing is, is not an option uh, because those kinds of uh, patronage declines are things that we really have to actually take seriously uh, and uh, address. Uh, the table below the chart just shows uh, a breakdown by the different uh, routes in the uh, existing uh, network uh, and shows uh, the annual revenue, uh, the annual passengers, uh, the average passengers uh, per trip, uh, the maximum load on any trip, and also the subsidy um, per passenger. And you'll see there are some pretty large figures in that last column which demonstrate that although we are still providing what on the face of it is a pretty good service for the size of area, um, the levels of, of patronage are not uh, reflecting that. And as a result, the subsidy is now considerably uh, higher than it once was when we had much higher levels of uh, growth. So that really does provide the context for uh, the need to undertake this, uh, this refresh work. So as with the Western Bay, um, the idea of the refresh is to make better use of our uh, existing uh, funding before uh, we think about where any uh, additional funding uh, might go. And there are a couple of pieces of historic context to give you. Uh, firstly, you will recall that back in uh, March and April of last year as part of the, or sorry, this year, I should say, uh, as part of the uh, annual plan, there was a consultation on uh, the future of the Rotorua uh, public transport network and various options were put forward uh, for improvements to that network. Uh, the public consultation perhaps wasn't as well uh, patronised as we would have ideally liked it to be. 
Um, but nevertheless, there were some views expressed uh, about a preferred approach, which is based on what's called the balanced network. Uh, and that still forms part of our long term uh, aspiration uh, to deliver service improvements. But before we do that, uh, we have to uh, make better use of what we've got and get the existing network on a, a stable footing. Um, the other piece of really important context is again in relation to Waka Kotahi. Uh, so as part of uh, the uh, National Land Transport Programme uh, settlement, Waka Kotahi have uh, declined to um, provide support to uh, the essentially the balanced approach in uh, the, uh, the RLTP. Uh, so they've said that essentially at the moment, because of the concerns around um, the levels of patronage, uh, they're not currently prepared to put money from the NLTP into the process to uh, increase services. And uh, in all honesty, that's pretty understandable because, again, we need to stabilise and get some growth and give our co-investors at Waka Kertahi uh, confidence that we've got something they can actually then back in the uh, the future. Uh, and the opportunity is um, pretty live because we will have uh, a new contract for Rotorua in 2024. Uh, so there is an opportunity to use the next two or three years, essentially, not only to stabilise, but also to investigate uh, opportunities um, for improvements as part of that uh, new contract. So I don't want to give the impression to anyone that we're simply going to uh, do minimum and that road to uh, die for the rest of time. We are still very ambitious for growth, um, but we have to address the current issues as outlined in those patronage figures um, before we do that. So very briefly, uh, how do we actually uh, make that happen? So uh, on uh, page uh, 76 of your uh, pack is essentially an outline of a uh, revised network for, for road to Rua. Uh, and essentially there are um, some design principles associated with that that I want to very, very briefly uh, take you through. Um, the first of those is to essentially simplify the existing uh, network of, I think it's 11 routes into five. Uh, three of those would essentially operate cross town and two would terminate in or near uh, the CBD. Um, so there's much greater uh, legibility and consistency uh, for the customer having a a smaller number of routes actually does make things quite a lot easier uh, to, to understand. Uh, critical to all of this is improving access to and within um, the CBD um, by serving both existing stops and a series of new bus stops uh, in both directions. On page 77, uh, there is a map which shows proposals for um, new bus stops in the CBD and also removal of uh, some bus stops that actually uh, could be surplus to requirements. Uh, overall, there's an increase in the number of stops in the CBD. And that's because at the moment, the challenge we have is that there are a small number of stops in locations that are not ideal for where people actually need to get to. And providing more stops uh, certainly helps to increase that penetration of the commercial area and get people, particularly those with mobility impairments, much closer uh, to where they need to be. So the infrastructure side of this uh, project is absolutely critical to uh, its overall success. Uh, it has to be implemented in conjunction with the service changes that we have, have outlined. And that's something that we'll be discussing further uh, with Waka Kotahi and also internally to understand how we may fund those uh, uh, infrastructure improvements. Uh, key to all this, of course, is Rotary Lakes Council uh, as the road controlling authority and the provider of uh, infrastructure. Um, we've been having a lot of very detailed discussions with them about the uh, refresh project. They have been really, really supportive and again, are an absolute pleasure to work with. And we feel that um, we've got a, uh, a really good way forward now in terms of investigating how we can actually get these improvements for our passengers. We're all on the same page. And we're also really excited to be contributing to some much wider issues around the, uh, the CBD 
uh, regeneration. There's never really been, I think, a better time uh, to undertake these changes in, in Rotorua. Um, we're also looking at uh, ensuring that uh, punctuality is improved. Now, primarily that is around making sure that existing timetables actually reflect uh, realities on the ground. So a lot of people have talked about the, uh, the roadworks and the impact of those, both those on Tenai Road and also now out towards Nongataha. Um, those roadworks will be going on for a period of time and our uh, timetables will need to reflect the realities of delays that currently exist on the network. Certainly in future, we'll be looking at bus priority uh, to minimise those delays. But as part of this project, we essentially have to uh, get the existing uh, punctuality working better so that people have confidence that well, perhaps their bus might take slightly longer in terms of time. It at least will turn up when it says it does. You know, that's absolutely critical for uh, customer confidence. And as I mentioned uh, right at the start of this meeting, uh, marketing and fair promotion you know, is absolutely critical to everything we we do. You know, Rotorua is a great place to uh, live and also to come and visit. And we feel there's an awful lot we can do as part of a, a post-COVID recovery to promote uh, the bus network, not only to the people who even work there, um, but the people who visit Rotorua for uh, for leisure and for, for holidays. Uh, there's a huge number of opportunities that we have uh, identified. And uh, in the report towards the end, I think on page uh, 78, we've got quite a long list of, of ideas, things we'd ideally like to, to try out as part of this um, process. Uh, so when we go to uh, a public consultation exercise, which we're looking at for um, sometime um, in the middle of uh, 2022, um, we'll have some really great ideas about what customers might actually want to see and what would encourage them to use the, um, the bus network. Um, that really is in terms of um, the report, all I want to cover. We're happy, uh, Andrew and myself, to answer any um, more uh, detailed questions. Uh, Again, as with the Western Bay, uh, COVID does introduce some concerns and issues around um, public consultation. Ideally, we'd always like to do it face to face because it means we get much better interaction with uh, customers and communities than we would online. Um, but in the world we live in, uh, the ability to do that is somewhat uh, compromised at the moment, which is why at the moment we are uh, still a little bit uncertain about what we're going to do in terms of public consultation and when we're going to do it. But be clear, we will be consulting extensively on this in order to understand uh, whether these proposals are going to make a real difference to uh, the way that people uh, view the public transport network in Rotorua, which is uh, something we want communities to be proud of. Thank you. All right, I've got um, three um, people wanting to a uh, question. Uh, Councillor Thurston first, Mr. Thomas, and then Commissioner Selwood. Councillor Thurston. Thank you, Chairman. Look, I, look, I'll be really brief. Look, um, I'm happy to move the recommendations on page 73. Um, clearly, it's an example of doing nothing's uh, not an option. Um, and likewise, I think it's a real classic textbook example of use it or lose it. Um, but can I just commend our staff and everyone for the collaboration and the consultation with RLC because I collectively believe, or I genuinely believe that um, it's through a collective uh, approach that we will sort this out. So, um, but no, um, it's a sad state of affairs, public transport in Rotorua, but we've provided a Rolls-Royce service uh, and it hasn't been used. And uh, as I've commented on a number of occasions, uh, everyone in Rotorua appears to drive their own motor car. So, um, uh, pressure on the bus service is uh, just not forthcoming. So, no, happy to move it when it comes to time. But um, thank you to the staff for the uh, collaboration and consultation that they're ongoing doing with uh, RLC. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Thurston. Mr Thomas. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair. Look, I'd just like to reiterate um, Councillor Thurston's comments. Um, I know staff at Rotorua have really enjoyed working with with um, regional council staff on this project and there is excitement around it. Um, I, I just, I would implore both staff and councillors um, that, that the recommendation two 
that the consultation will now take place mid-2022. I, I do want to say that is too late. Um, and I would implore that consultation to happen February, March. Um, a huge reason for this is especially looking at putting in new bus stops or rearranging things in the CBD. To be able to do that in 2022, RLC will need to put variances into their annual plan. If we don't do this till mid-2022, then nothing can happen from RLC's point of view until mid-2023. So it's just another year's delay. So if we can bring that consultation forward to early 2022, I think that's absolutely vital to keep this moving forward. <clears throat> um, just a, a couple of quick comments um, about the plan changes and um, I think that, that they look great and simplifying the routes is a really good way to go. Um, I know that COVID really impacted on working this stuff out. I know, um, especially for you, Andrew, um, it is quite an imposition on you. And, and I just want to make a couple of comments, especially around the layout for the CBD and the new bus stops, that what I would like to see is if council with both council staff can get together um, as soon as practical and maybe do a site visit to some of those new sites because actually while it might look on google maps that these are appropriate places when you get out and physically check where they where they are they're sites that that quite likely won't work and for Kawi street for instance looks great on google maps but it's difficult to get a car down let alone a bus there is so much parking in that street. So I think there are some areas there that need a little bit of, of movement around, maybe a little bit more thought on the processes. Um, once again, around some of those bus stops, great to sort those out, but some locations most probably aren't feasible. Um, I think my final comment, just going back to that mid-2022, I don't know what it's like for regional councillors, <clears throat> but electioneering starts early in Rotorua, and this, if it was in the, if this consultation was done mid-year, it could very easily become a politicised football. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas, and uh, through the chair, uh, we certainly will uh, go away and uh, reconsider our uh, timeframes. We're trying to balance an awful lot of work here, and also. Um, staff pressure as a result of COVID. So we're, we're trying our best to, to get the balance between um, getting on with stuff we'd really love to get on with and recognising the realities of the situation we find ourselves in. But you're absolutely right in terms of, um, you know, ideally we would be going out exactly as you say, and we will certainly do our level best to come up with something um, that meets those timescales and gets things moving for the very valid reasons that you uh, you outline. Uh, yes, absolutely right. In terms of site visits, we we know to our cost from other areas of the uh, uh, region that when um, particularly um, consultants uh, do uh, uh, work on uh, relocations of um, bus facilities, and if they don't actually visit the sites and understand the realities on the ground you can get some pretty um, suboptimal uh, outcomes associated with those so uh, subject to the uh, restrictions and complying with all the very necessary government uh, health and safety requirements we are intending um, to get out and uh, look at those practical issues in detail with colleagues from uh, RLC uh, sometime uh, in December Andrew in particular is chomping at the bit from his um, Auckland gilded cage to get out down there. Um, so if we can make it happen, we absolutely will. And thank you again for your support. Yeah. Um, thank Good you, on. James. And um, Andrew, we look forward to seeing you. And James, on that consultation, RLC staff are really happy to assist in any way they can. Awesome. Thank you. Andrew. Uh, just, just to add to um, endorse all James has said and to say that uh, I've already been talking to Nikki Carling at uh, Rotorua Lakes, and we've got a, a site meeting scheduled uh, for uh, next month before Christmas, um, because yeah, the, the, the devil can be in the detail in bus stop positioning. And the other thing we're doing is we're gonna to talk to 
Richie's the contractor because the other big thing is to make sure that they're on board uh, with delivering any changes that we make and also just getting down to some of those real detailed stuff about driving a bus around the new proposed routes and making sure that if we say the bus can do A to B in 12 minutes, it can do it in 12 minutes. Because as James said, you know, punk punctuality and reliability are so important. Commissioner Selwood. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, say this is exactly an example of the kind of analysis that I think uh, is fundamental to getting better service provision into the future. I think the, um, so thank you, Andrew, for all of your work. The analysis on page 81 is uh, exactly what um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do right across the network. I think probably the missing element for me is the time of day data. And when you look at the average passengers per trip at overall of 2.46, uh, which is scarcely better than a um, private motor vehicle, which are typically sort of about one to 1.5, um, it, it signals that the frequency of service is, is an issue as much as the route, and that's what driving some of the subsidy per passenger uh, much higher. And going back to our previous agenda item, the potential for greater frequency for commuters at peak and much lower frequency or even on-demand service for those off-peak uh, and blending those to optimise uh, subsidy uh, might be the way for the future, but certainly on the basis of what we've seen, this route plan for Rotorua looks uh, effective um, and an opportunity for us to really uh, analyse further about how on-demand on -demand services might be a better option for the Rotorua and indeed the Tauranga context for certain locations. Uh, so just a comment, but uh, well done to the team for the analysis so far. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Commissioner Selwood. And yes, I think the um, uh, forthcoming uh, contract review and renewal for Rotorua provides an opportunity to look at all kinds of um, different service model options. And that's going to be a really uh, critical piece of work to undertake post this refresh, which at least we hope will um, provide firstly some very good data and insights into what's going on and why people um, don't use the bus as much as we'd ideally like them to, and then taking that forward into uh, future uh, service designs and looking at, looking at all kinds of factors which um, will enable us to come up with what we believe will be a, uh, a much better and uh, well-used service in the future. Uh, Councillor Thurston. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Look, I'd, if uh, you're willing, I'd like to propose an amended recommendation part two that public consultation on the Rotorua bus network refresh, refresh be conducted in the first quarter 2022. Um, I, it's got to be practical for staff. So um, do we have an opinion on that, James? Um, the only opinion I can offer at the moment without talking to my, my staff and understanding our um, resource issues is that we'll do our absolute uh, level best and we certainly would like to do that because that was our, our previous intention so um, we don't take the um, decision to defer things lightly um, so we'll go away and and have a look at that and just provide some reassurance as to what we can um, practically do uh, and bearing in mind the COVID restrictions as well in terms of our uh, method whether it is face-to-face -face or uh, more online. Namuja. Through the chair as well, just to add to that, you'll recall we are also um, rolling out free fares for school students um, early next year too. So this will be the first time it rolls out in Rotorua. So we just want to ensure that uh, we have sufficient staff to be able to cover that, especially in the January, February um, months as well. I think we have the staff, Chairman. Pregnant silence. Well, you know, we, we do have to be practical and right. so I don't think your wording um, gives, gives enough uh, wriggle room. Okay, really. but can we, can, we, can we note somewhere in the minute that's taken that the committee's preference is for first quarter 2022? Yeah, that, that's right. 
Are I'm, you backing, happy? I'm backing off here now, you realise, Chairman. Yeah. I do. I do. That. I do. So yeah, that's you. fine. That's absolutely thank fine. You know, we thank should acknowledge... We, are, the, um, we all understand the, the sentiment. So, Mr Thomas, are you seconding that resolution? So, the, um, Amanda, have you got the wording? For, for part two? I'll it just share my changed. screen. My understanding was it was staying the same, but we're noting in the mi minutes that the committee preference is that it happens earlier. First quarter 2022. In the first quarter 2022. Yep. Thank you, Amanda. Everybody um, happy? Uh, Chair, through you, could, could we just possibly change it to instead of take place mid 2022? Um, just change it to at the earliest possible date, 2022, which covers the range that 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 allows for um, uh, staff to be comfortable that they are able to do it. Um, so we're just looking at the first possible date. Is everyone happy with that? The mover, Lyle? I can live with that. You can live with that, seconded. Do we have any discussion that you can see the, the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Against, aye. carried. Thank you very much. And I think we, we've done the, the um, Public excluded. I think they came forward, didn't they? In the when I did the uh, original um, minutes. That's, That's correct. Sure. There's no, yeah. no need to go into public excluded now. All right. Any closing comments by anybody before we finish? We wanted to be finished at twelve thirty. It's we're nine minutes late, but we can live with that. Well, through the chair, I would just like to wish everyone a very happy Christmas. I think we can now say that on the thirtieth of November. Okay, that sounds good to me. And and thank you, staff, for, for you know, you are putting in a big effort in public transport, in my view. Um, it is a it is always uh, emotionally a struggle when we look at empty buses in our uh, Tauranga city in particular. Uh, but, you know, them's the brakes. I can see jammed up cars in the middle of the day on Takatimu Drive down there going into a Elizabeth Street right now. So it's not just a bus issue, it's a car issue as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Uh -huh. I declare the meeting closed.